Okay. All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll get started. We're about uh, half hour late due to technical problems, but our hero, Jim Hall, Master Dramatic Consultant, has saved us all. <laughs> If any of you saw Galaxy Quest, Commander Taggart has saved us all. Well, Jim has too. So here we are, finally, with Dramatica, Past, Present, Future, and Beyond. The program will last about two hours, so we'll be running about half an hour late into it. Um, this is the beginning of two different series of classes. Uh, to be honest, I'm 63, and I'm near retirement age, and mind can't keep track of all the Dramatica that I have learned and worked with and kept to myself a lot of it because it's only speculation over the last 25 years. Yes, in fact, this is indeed the 25th anniversary of Dramatica this year. It's 25 years since uh, since it was first created. And um, we're celebrating by having these two sets of classics. I happen to be down in Burbank now and can, can do these kinds of recordings, which I couldn't do on my own. Definitely need Jim's help and all of you here and all of you out there to um, to make sure that we uh, can get this information documented before I forget it all. The free ones are going to be on Monday nights, but not every Monday night. Uh, we have a schedule. If you go to storymind, S-T-O-R-Y-M-I-N-D dot com slash classes, you will find a list of all the classes that we have scheduled so far uh, all the way through the end of July. Half of them are free to our classes in the evenings just like this which will uh, include a live video stream, a recording made of it afterwards that uh, anyone can see at any time and streaming video, and also uh, the live presentation. So we only have 12 seats in the place. It's a small room, and whoever uh, comes in and reserves first on these can get there. Uh, so take a look at those and see topics you want. We'll probably do a total of maybe 20 or some on classes. Uh, may not repeat any of them. I can pretty much say this one's never going to be repeated because um, it's just a documentation of how Dramatic was created, uh, how we came up with the ideas, what inspired us, what made Chris and myself the kind of people that would want to go out and actually do these kinds of things, spend this kind of time, commit ourselves to this instead of going off and writing stories of our own. We were in the filmmaking industry. And after Dramatic in the past, and we see how it came to the Dramatic you all know and love today, we're going to talk about Dramatic in the present, including a lot of things you've not heard about, and including working on counterterrorism for any agency you've ever heard of that has three letters standing for its name, we've probably worked for them over the last five years uh, and had a lot of success in trying to uh, determine if we could figure out who was going to be a lone wolf terrorist and who wasn't, and also uh, in keeping track of other nations at a narrative level and being able to project using signposts and journeys uh, the course of events that might be taking place. And after five years, our initial results that we came up with have proven themselves as accurate in the real world as dramatic and has been accurate in the world of fiction for the last quarter century. And after we look at what we've been doing today, including those black ops that we've been involved in, we're going to move on to Dramatica of the future. There's a lot planned for Dramatica. It takes a long time to get there because much of it is complicated, but it has a lot to do with big data, auto-ingest, uh, natural language processing, uh, automatic uh, story forming uh, based on AI and uh, I'll be discussing a bunch of that. And then move into the last section. Naturally, it's a quad, past, present, future, and beyond Dramatica. And the last section, Beyond Dramatica, will be dealing with the more philosophic, metaphysics, scientific. It'll talk about everything from physics, nuclear physics, astrophysics, uh, all the way to psychology, uh, social movements, um, and personal problem solving, and where Dramatica and narrative, in fact, not by the Dramatica name, but just narrative, which happens to be labeled Dramatica as a model of it, uh, fits into everything that we see and everything we do and determines what patterns we're able to see. Why we see the laws of physics are not because those are the only laws, they're because they're the only laws we can perceive that have a pattern. That's a little hint for you. So we're going to begin tonight this is the part that if you've been trying to wait for this to come online and you really need to go off to the restaurant or get a snack, you can do that because I'm going to talk about Chris and myself in our early years, what made us the kind of people that would want to create Dramatica. Get that out of the way as fast as I can, and then we can move on to the stuff that pertains more directly to Dramatica. So here's the first thing I'm going to show is uh, this. That's right. That's uh, my mom and my dad. And me, I'm the one in the middle. Um, and uh, that was taken when I was about a year old, uh, maybe a little less. Uh, the, one of the reasons that I turned out to be the kind of person that would end up 
uh, being involved with something like dramatic and putting my time into it. So my mother always wanted to be a writer, an English teacher. She loved psychology, as did my grandmother. And my mom was also involved in little theater right here in Burbank uh, for many years. My father was uh, a project engineer on the Polaris Missile Development System, the first missile to be successfully fired from underwater. And uh, he was off to Cape Canaveral all the time. He used to send me little pictures of missiles breaking the surface. He was very proud of his work. But at age 12, he entered a national poetry contest um, that uh, uh, it won first place in the entire country. But they had to take the word away because they had accidentally put his entry in the adult category and he won that and he was only 12. It should have been the children's. So there is in the family an interest in science, an interest in art, and I was exposed to both of them. And then my grandfather was the photographer in the family. He's the one who, um, who took all the movies, would bring out the old screen that had blast beads on it. You could smell the glue they used to hold those on the screen. And then he'd fire up the old projector, eight millimeter projector, not super eight, eight millimeter. And that thing would roll and it would clack and you would see all these wonderful memories that you'd have projected on the screen every once in a while for movie night became enraptured with movies. And uh, we'll talk about a little more about that in a moment. But the first thing we want to do is move on to another seminal event very quickly. Um, that's my grandfather right there and me on a swing set. It says April 72, that's a reprint. It was actually 1958. And that was a backyard here in Burbank. And the reason the swing set's important is because that's where I had my first thought that gave me the angst that made me go after Dramatica in the hopes it would solve it. And you know what? It actually did. But here's what the angst was. I'm a five-year-old kid. I'm supposed to be just sitting on the swing. It was an overcast day. It was seamless gray. You couldn't see any modeling. It was like a gray card, you know? It was beautiful. And I was swinging on my swing. And there were some trees on either side that were sort of getting up my peripheral vision. And I was wondering in whatever kind of language five years old to use, I don't remember the words, I remember the experience, okay? And I was thinking, can I get high enough to be able to see nothing but gray? Just nothing but gray. I don't want to see anything. I just want to see gray. I've never seen nothing before. So I thought it would be really cool to get a good, a good look at nothing. So I swing higher and higher and higher. And finally I got all the way up to the top. My swing set was like teetering because it wasn't hooked to the ground. You know, it was very terrifying. Five, six-year-old kid. And I'm up there. And finally I caught a glimpse of nothing but gray. And I stopped and I took myself down and, and, and got rid of the, the willies from having, you know, almost knocked myself over. And then I was blessed and cursed with this wonderful, horrible thought. Okay. And the thought was, okay, if there really was nothing, would it be black because there was no light or would it be gray because there was also no black? Now, of course, there's lots of other combinations we know today and using dramatic, I could figure out a million of different possibilities. But in that time, that's as far as I could think. And I thought about it back and forth and back and forth. And I realized I couldn't tell if one was more right than the other. And I'd been raised in a religious family, so I said, well, if God knows everything, God must know. He must know whether it's it's black or whether it's gray is what you'd see if there was nothing, okay? Never occurring to me if there was nothing, I wouldn't be there and wouldn't see anything at all, okay? But the fact is that I, I said, well, that must mean that God can see stuff I can't see because he's all seeing and I'm less. In what way is he more than me? In what way am I less than that? What part of me is missing that would allow me to see that, okay? And the thing was, it didn't bug me that I couldn't understand which was the better one. It bugged me that I didn't know why I couldn't understand which was the better one. Okay, and that for a five-year-old kid is too big a thought to have. But it stuck in my mental craw, and it was there all of my life. And when we began working with Dramatica, it came back to haunt me. And that was actually my motivating factor, was to try and figure out why there were things that I could not see the answer to. Not that I didn't know the answer, but I couldn't see it. And Dramatica seemed to hold the key for that. That's my swing set moment. We only have like one or two more short ones of these, and then we get on to, uh, by the way, Chris's mom and dad. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, come on in. <laughs> we talked on, on video the other day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, nice to see you. Um, anyway, um, Chris's mom and dad, his dad was like vice president of Clorox Corporation for like zillions of years. And uh, he was a sharp guy. They used to uh, have a situation where the, all the executives in the country who were at a high level would try to figure out what the gross national product was going to be the next year. It's kind of a game. And he hit it within like $100,000, like, you know, that year. But he was always very close. That year, he beat out everybody in the country. So he had that. And his mom, Chris's mom, had the same kind of skills he does. She was a painter. She's had gallery showings. And she's a very free spirit. Okay. And so he had all of this going for him. And eventually, the two was made at USC. But here's the, uh, the next thing I'm going to show you here is that uh, I got interested in film 
right here. Um, previous, this is uh, stand out of the way here. That's actually my classroom in sixth grade on the very last day uh, before graduation, the last day I ever attended sixth grade. And those are my classmates. I was given a still camera by my parents and a little eight millimeter reel to reel um, camera to take pictures too. And so I did take the pictures and I did take the movies, but it turns out that it wasn't properly threaded and all those movies were lost when the pictures survived and they were upset. And so being a poor family, they gathered everything they had together and bought one of the first Instamatic Super 8 movie cameras with a fixed lens and an on-off switch and that's all that it had, okay? Uh, electric eye, okay, it was really cool. But that's everything they had and they bought it to replace it for me. And uh, um, I had had an experience where an uncle had come in uh, to take us someplace in the car and he had a flip book of Hop Along Cassidy of all things in the back of the car. And uh, they showed me how to use it. I was again, like, you know, six years old. And I could flip it and I could see the still images and I could see the moving images. And I already thought a lot about movies because of what my grandfather did. And then when I saw that it was made up of little pictures like this, I was hooked. So they got me the movie camera. And after that with the Instamatic, I started doing little bzz, bzz, bzz on the on off switch and making, you know, flowers open and things and, and animation. Had a lot of fun with it. And I ultimately went off to USC to study. And that's where I met Chris. So. Here we are with a, uh, a quick shot. This is not at USC. This is when we were later doing the strangeness, but he was still at USC when we were doing it. So this is what Chris Huntley looked like back in the 70s. Okay, I don't know if you can get a good glimpse there of him, but uh, we'll make these pictures available in another form too, so they show up really well. Uh, don't worry about that. But he's sitting there with his uh, editing system and uh, working away, and he looks very 70s. Okay. <laughs> anyway, that's good old Chris. Now, we met. Uh, through uh, my film partner. He was a roommate. Chris was in Fanatic Option. He was so brilliant. They let him choose whatever classes he wanted and they give him a degree. Okay. So uh, I wanted to study film and uh, through my film partner met Chris. And uh, in doing that, uh, I worked at USC for a couple of years. Didn't get my degree. I never actually got my degree. I quit because I couldn't support myself um, and also uh, take care of it. And my dad, who was putting me through college said, well, I'll pay for your rent and I'll pay for everything else. And I just couldn't have it. I mean, that was too much. I needed to take care of myself. So I quit USC and I went to work for uh, Dick Soltis, a small filmmaker. And then he had to lay me off and he felt bad and got me a job at Dave Bell Associates. And there I learned all the tricks of the trade of film. And at that point, then uh, I, I was just working my way up and having my own editing room. And that's when they lost a production and everybody got knocked down a notch, and I ended up, after all those years of film and everything, the manager of the shipping department for educational films. I had diarrhea for two weeks. <laughs> it was horrible, but I needed a job. Well, they felt sorry for me, so I made an arrangement to make a feature motion picture on the weekends with their equipment, 16 millimeter equipment, and their truck, and all the people I worked with at no cost, and they let me have it to go out there and shoot a film on the weekends with all their stuff as long as I had it back by Monday morning. So we went out and filmed something called The Strangers, and Chris, was my co-writer, co-producer, along with uh, Mark Sulicki, another the film partner that I met Chris through, and we made this thing called The Strangeness. Now, The Strangeness was really awful. Still, it's considered a cult classic from the 1980s. It was actually made in 79, and, and we released it in 1980. They all have the time wrong when it was released. Here is the poster that we came up with on the left, and on the right is the Blu-ray DVD that came out with a few years ago that includes commentary by all three of us who were the producers of it and um, uh, extra interviews and some of Chris's and Mark's student films. And uh, Chris even created a page you can find it. I think it's the strangeness.net. And as you can see, there are very strange things about the production, the monster, the special effects. And in this monster over here, this is Steve Greenfield back when he was with us at USC. If you haven't seen him lately, he's the president of used to be Screenplay Systems, now it's called Wright Brothers. He was my director of photography. And uh, that's what he looked like way back when, in 1979, we were making this. There's Chris back in 79 when we were making it. The picture on the right is as Tony Ruggles. He appeared in the film as well as producing. And that's after the monster got him. Um, there's actually one last thing to show you. I'll show you a little bit of this here. And uh, it's a clip from the trailer. Strangeness, and I'm gonna jump in part way. It's really boring. We're looking at about a minute of this just to give you an idea of what we've built because it's from this movie that we determined to make Dramatica. Yeah. 
These are all mirrors that are nailed up on the walls of this mine. Oh, it's in Spanish. That doesn't help us at all. Well, anyway, this is the dubbed version. But basically, what he's saying is they put up the mirrors to see what was coming up behind them as they worked. Before the mine was closed, the miners were very spooked. And there was these legends and miners were disappearing. And so they put them up there. And then later on in the film, remember, this is a trailer. It's not a fast cut trailer. It's a trailer. Um, the fellow who's kind of the lead of the picture finds Chris, Tony Ruggles, his partner, all covered with goop. Now, it's shot at 2 in the morning uh, in about 28 degree temperature in Burbank, coldest day of the year, uh, on a concrete uh, garage floor underneath Chris, uh, concrete. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's enough of that. Anyway, but we had to not show it in certain countries when they released it because foaming at the mouth is considered taboo. But what happened was Chris was all covered with cornstarch and goop. Okay, and then he had to hold in his mouth baking soda and vinegar as long as he could. I mean, he could hold it no more, then he opened his eyes, and then he opened his mouth, and we had the scene. But we should have tinted it red. Okay, that was the thing where we made a mistake. All right, so the strangeness was okay, but it had a lot of story holes and problems. And Chris and I had become fast friends by then and had been sharing ideas about philosophy and life and what was going on. And we decided that before the next script, we wanted to learn story structure. Uh, matter of fact, we were going to work on a script called The Terminator before there ever was such a thing named like that. And we called it The Line That Divides Day From Night, which is what The Terminator means, you know, and, and that was kind of cool. And we could see we were having the same problems. So um, anyway, we decided that we would try and figure out what was going on. So at about 2 o'clock in the morning one night in my editing room behind my home, um, Chris and I determined we would sit down and crack the code of story structure. And this was... 1981 probably okay um and so we started and for the next two weeks we gave it our best we figured two weeks not be enough to solve a problem nobody had ever solved before so we uh came up with something called the rule of threes first thing was that every character has to be introduced their relationship with every other character has to be interacted and then it has to be resolved rule of threes everything had come in threes it was loosely based on you know beginning middle and end and and that sort of thing from Aristotle at the time. We hadn't read anything on story structure, really, except what had been mentioned in passing in the classes we took, and nobody really seemed to know. They said, well, this sometimes works, and this could be useful, but we have no idea what's going on. That's the best USC could do for story in those days. So we finally uh, looked at characters, and we started realizing archetypes. Star Wars had been out, we, you know, and we, um, Lucas went to USC. We saw a screening two weeks before it hit the public. He did a special screening at USC. It was really cool. And uh, we saw that there were pairs of archetypes, but we could only think of seven of them. And we figured seven, that's an odd number. Shouldn't, if they're all pairs, shouldn't they all have pairs? What's the pair to this one? And we got stuck. We couldn't go any farther. And here's where Chris did the most brilliant thing he ever did. He said, I don't think we have enough life experience. Now, this is from a 20-year-old. I don't think we have enough life experience. I think we should put this on ice for a while, go out, live a little bit, and come back to it sometime in the future. That's exactly what he said. And 10 years later, that's exactly what we did. 10 years later, there was a screenplay systems. And I'd gone off to work in the industry as a filmmaker. And Chris and Steve had formed screenplay systems and, and were uh, heavily involved in uh, selling equipment. And, and Steve, of course, and Chris got an Academy Award, technical award for the creation of Scriptor, the very first word processor for screenplays that automatically formatted. And we used to have offices in the same building, which is now Burbank Bar and Grill. And if you go over there, the women's room is where my office was. And Chris and Steve were kind of where the stairway is that goes inside. It wasn't there at the time. And that's where they had their offices. So we did things together all the time. And at that point, when we were uh, talking about screenplay systems, um, they were having a pretty good success of it. And I went off to edit a film called Prima Donnas. It was actually called Social Suicide, my first Panavision editing job. And it was so horrible for me that I ended up quitting the industry after it. I'd been in the industry like 10, 12 years as an editor, director, producer, stuff like that. And I hated it. I hated it so much. Everybody was squeezing everybody for all they could get, you know. But anybody who works in the industry, you know, that's the way it works. So after that was completed, uh, while it was actually still going on, Chris would go off to, um, to be vice president in charge of screenplay systems um, in the day. And I would go off to work on this, but every morning we'd get together for coffee and we'd start talking about story. And here's why. 
because Chris had called me up on the phone almost 10 years exactly after he said we should put it on hold. And he said, would you meet me over at the Coral Cafe in, in, in Burbank? I, something I'd like to talk to you about for breakfast. I said, sure, okay, let's do it. I met him for breakfast. He said, you know that old theory we had 10 years ago? I think maybe we have enough life experience now. Let's see if we can do something with story structure. And that became the beginning of Dramatica. And Jim Hall here, he came out the other day and actually shot some video out there. And, uh, and uh, I told the story of this, uh, how it all started with Dramatica. And from that point forward, we began to think about what actually made stories tick. Let me back this up a bit here. And so we got together every morning. I had a new cappuccino machine in the home. They were the latest rage. Nobody had one before. So I would make us a cup of cappuccino and we would sit there and we would talk about our life problems and then we'd see how maybe that fit into the story and life experience, like Chris said. What can we learn about narrative from that? And eventually we started migrating off to the back room there in California Street and Chris would ask questions that were things we didn't have answers to. Why ask a question you already know the answer to? We intentionally didn't study any people who had written during all those years uh, about story structure. We didn't want to know anybody other's ideas. We figured that if we reinvented the wheel, okay fine, we reinvented the wheel. But maybe we'd just go wandering off into a place everybody else had knew better not to go into and find something they hadn't seen. So we did not expose ourselves to what everybody else said about the story. And Chris finally said, and here's the very beginning of the dramatic notion, if there's a character like Scrooge, and he is the cause of the story's problems, and he doesn't know it, how is that possible? It's not that he knows it and denies it, that it's a different thing. He doesn't see it. He can't see that he's the cause of the story's problems. There must be a blind spot. There must be some kind of uh, blind side, some kind of filter that prevents him from seeing it. And as a result of that, we, uh, we started looking into the psychological aspects of, uh, of story. One of the things we looked into was uh, justification. We started talking about, um, I'll put these up, you won't be able to see them on the, there very well, but uh, we started talking about can and need and want and should. Those seem to us to be very justified positions because what you can do is not what you're really able to do. It's it's limited somehow. What you need is not necessarily what's required. It's what you've decided you want to have for what you want. And, and want, even that, is saying is a, a lack. It's not like a desire for something. It's a lack of something that, that you're saying, I, I ought to have because I'm lacking it, and therefore a lack needs to be filled. So their opposition should, that's saying, maybe you want to do this, but you can't do that because you should do this, you know, regardless of what you need. And you start getting into all these kinds of what we call them rationalizations at the time. So we had can, actually we did it this way, can, want, need, should. I'll stay true to the chart. Can, want, need, and should. And from that, we began to figure out what is really the... Uh, the place that this, this goes to. It must go somewhere from there. You can't just stay here. And we realized that there was knowledge, thought, ability, and desire. Knowledge, I'll just put no, thought, T, ability, desire. And then there were these things. If you went down to what you knew, what you thought, what your real abilities were, and what you really desired, then you were rationalizing. rationalizing. When you went into what you can, what you want, what you need, what you should, then you're rationalizing. So, then we thought, well, what's on the other end of that? And we started looking at commitment and, uh, and uh, rationalization, commitment and rationalization and responsibility and obligation. And these were four higher levels of rationalization that are carrying part of it. The word rationalization was in there, so we said, we can't call this process rationalization, and these things are rationalizations. So we looked at this process as justification, justifying why you do what you do, justifying why you feel what you feel. In real life, real people feeling these things and trying to justify that so they can go along that course and make these commitments, no matter how the situation changes, they're still going to make these commitments because that's what's in their heart. And the other things that we had, they, you know, they've decided it's going to be that way regardless. We're sense of self, sense of, sense of self, okay, and state of being. So 
who you think you are, how you feel about yourself, and who you really are, state of being, situation, and circumstances. Okay. And now you're talking about things that are completely external, as opposed to things that are coming from within. You're now starting to talk about situations and circumstances, and how you really are, and you're so far away from thought, uh, knowledgeability, and desire. So after we did this for a while, this was the extent of the Dramatica chart. And these were in the Dramatica chart at the beginning. And what we did is eventually they all got lost because we realized that that was the process of justification. And the only ones you can find there is where justification and clear thinking converge. That is it, knowledge, thought, ability, and desire at that pure level of the way the mind really works. So those rationalizations and justifications, that was a, a big thing that we had dealt with. And we began to have lunches with Steve Greenfield and tell him about this. And he was very intrigued because he was interested in the story. He was writing screenplays. He got one published at Disney. And when we talked to him about, you know, what you need is not necessarily required, well, he said, that's, that's absolute. That's objective. I mean, you need air to breathe. And Chris would say, well, if you want to uh, kill yourself by suffocation, the last thing you need is air. So Steve would come up with another one, and Chris would come up with a counter. And, sh and it went on like this for a few weeks before Steve finally realized there wasn't anything he'd come up with that he'd say that's absolutely needed that was true in all contexts. That there were some contexts in which that's a, the last thing you needed was what you originally thought you needed under these circumstances. Okay, And when that happened, he realized it was a justification. It wasn't the pure KTAD. They were thinking at Screenplay Systems of going with a, another I shall not name uh, story guru of the time uh, and making some software to just help writers write. They were going to do that. But Steve became so intrigued with what we were coming up with, they said, let's put that on hold and let's instead start working with this. Maybe there's some software in it down the line. But before we got there, Chris and I had thought we would write this thing called Wordsmith. Um, before I ever came to screen places at the time, before it became Ryan Feathers, um, this is something uh, Jim just put up uh, from an old document I have. Story, Chapter 1, A New Hope. We were so full of ourselves in those <laughs> days. It started with something called Wordsmith, about Dr. Wordsmith, who was this expert on story structure, and a reporter goes to him and interviews him, and he uses all kinds of gizmos and gadgets to explain how story structure works. A lot of that was our work on rule of threes expanded, you know, and archetypes and very simple stuff by today's comparison. We had no master view or master plan of what stories were, but we had a collection of useful stuff that we hadn't heard anywhere else. And so Dr. Wordsmith was going to explain it to everybody. But it was kind of silly, and the stuff we started coming up with was getting even more and more interesting. And finally, uh, we decided it was just too serious to go that way, so we wrote a new book, started it called Story, before McKee used the title. Okay. And um, we wrote it a lot more like this is what's really happening, a story, trying to provide a, a broader view as we were developing it. And uh, eventually we gave up on that too. And I went to Wright Brothers at the time, Screenplay Systems, uh, to work for about three years, uh, eight hours a day in a room just about this size, to try and develop Dramatica along with Chris as my total and primary job. As soon as that movie that I hated was over, uh, that I Edited on, you can find my name on the editing credits on IMDb on that one, but as soon as that was over, I was out of there. Now, here's the next thing that's of interest, is that Chris and I, I wasn't at Screenplay Systems yet, Chris and I were just working on the, uh, the system here, and we had our initial discoveries, we did the lunches, and we came to this equations magic moment. Now, here I am in my living room. Uh, when Chris and I were meeting, it was about that time. And uh, as you can see, things have changed in 25 years. <laughs> okay. But that was me then. Okay. And uh, and so was this with my uh, my little uh, stuffed animal ice cream. And I was sure there was a math answer to the relationship among this KT and AD. We knew the four of them had some kind of a relationship, but we didn't know what it was. Knowledge was somehow related to thought and to desire and to ability. We could feel it. We could feel it in the discussions we had. But we just didn't know what that relationship was. We hadn't invented the quad yet. Okay. And so uh, I said, i got to solve this. And Chris said, look, we've installed on this for a week. We've got all these great ideas. We need to get into people. You've got, you know, till Friday. And then we got to move on. we got to move on. We can't do it anymore. And I said, okay, Friday, you got yourself a compromise deal. So it was very hot. It was summer. I went to sleep one night. 
uh, that or, uh, in the day there when I've been thinking about it. I went to sleep under the hot tin roof that it was in the back room, uh, sunroom we had there in California Street. And uh, when I slept, I had this vision of like I could have any answer I wanted in the universe. I could know if there was a hereafter. I could know if the universe would continue expanding or contracting. I could know if there was a supreme being. And they said, what do you want to know in my dream? And I said, I want the equation. Stupid me, okay? I could have had anything, but I said I want the equation, all right? And so I could see the equation. It was tangible. It was something I could reach out and touch, and I could see that I see the meaning of that. And I knew I could only take one thing with me when I woke up. So I went ahead, and I grabbed the equation, clutched it to myself, threw myself awake, went over to where I had a notepad right next to the bed, and wrote one side multiplies the other divides. I had no idea what it meant. But that's what the equation was. That's what I woke up with. It translated that from the thing I'd been holding, whatever it was, into those words. One side multiplies, the other divides. And I put that down on the paper. And I said, I'm going to look at that in a minute, and I'm going to see if that actually has some meaning. So I went into the, the restroom and brushed my teeth because it was so damn hot in the place. I was like, you know, bottom of a birdcage in my mouth, you know. So I went in there, and I reached for the red. I said, why am I reaching for the red? I always reach for the shape of the tube of toothpaste. I'm reaching for the red. I was actually thinking this. It's like I was reaching for a color, not a thing. And it's like, what am I doing? You know, was, I had a stroke or something out there in the heat. You know, I really was worried about myself. And then I said, well, God, that's weird. So I went out and I, I looked around the room and everything seemed a little different. It's peculiar, you know, have I, have I like gone into another dimension or another reality or something. And I walked out in, in the front yard and I looked around and there was some yellow grass and some green grass, but it was like neon yellow and neon green. I've never taken acid, but I know those who have, and they tell me that's what it looks like sometimes. It was like twilight amped up about 10 times. Everything was like blazing so much, I had to go back in the house, I couldn't take it. And I came in and I sat down and I tried to figure it out. And then here's what I figured out it was. The reason I was able to find the equation, and this, is, this isn't like the virgin birth or anything, mind you, it's not all metaphysical, but it was a lot of coincidences, right people at the right place. I was looking for the equation on the exact day when I fell asleep in the heat. I was halfway between waking and sleeping, and the conscious mind, if it works spatially, the subconscious mind will work temporally. If the conscious mind works temporally, the subconscious mind will work spatially. That's one of the major differences between men and women right there is which one thinks spatially and temporally in the conscious and the other, because you need both. And after you use one all day, the other one when you sleep is how you process it on the other side that you can't consciously access, but you still get the value of that calculation. It's, it's part of our survival traits. So I had waking and sleeping, space time, and I have one other thing. Here's a picture of me about two or three years before these other two pictures I showed you here. That's a picture of me and my daughter. And that's about uh, the time I was making the strangeness. This is also me with my son when I made the strangeness. And that's right, uh, back 25 years ago, I was in transition from male to female at the same time we were doing Dramatica, the same time we were coming up with the theory. And many of the things that happened in the theory happened because of the hormones I was taking, which were almost like a drug. And when I fell asleep, just a couple days earlier, they had changed my hormone dose, and I was still getting a full dose of male hormones. And they gave me this really strong dose of female hormones, stronger than I ever had before. And so I was between waking and sleeping and the male hormones and the female hormones. And that quad of influences put me on the head of a pin that I swear probably nobody ever on the face of the earth had been at while they were trying to solve an equation. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure everybody goes through transitions, reached that moment. They probably woke up, and they had that moment where they shifted over from one side to the other, and all of a sudden, colors were very much more important. After a while, they amped down, okay, so that you see them more to begin with, but then the mind adjusts. So men and women pretty much see colors the same way, I can tell you that, but they don't see it at the same level biologically. Biologically, it's much more intense for women, but they ramp it down, and guys ramp it up, and you end up seeing exactly the same thing but one's ramped up and one's ramped down in order to, to perceive the world we see. But at that one moment, all those influences led to that equation. And without those, I don't think we would have ever had that equation. And I don't think we would have the story entry we have today because everything that you see there depends on it. Other than that, it's just a collection of little influences. It's just a collection of little 
bits and pieces of story knowledge, but with that equation, it suddenly came together. So maybe it was meant to happen. Maybe there are powers that be, you know, I had no, you know, I didn't get any golden tablets that I translated. I, I, I didn't have a virgin birth. I didn't, you know, none of this stuff. You know, I don't know whether any of that's true or not. I can tell you there was no divine influence that made itself known to me, but it sure was a lot of coincidences just when we needed them, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's that's the pictures I prefer to look back on here. <laughs> but I love my kids and I value those times with them as well. All throughout the process of Dramatica, a lot of these um, a lot of these things to do with that transition came into play. I had not yet had my surgery at the time we started Dramatica, and I had it during the middle of the creation process. There was one day when I had worked out a series of amazing equations about Dramatica. That's okay, you can sleep back on. Okay. Yeah, uh, I had a bunch of equations, and I had the boards covered with it, and we went out to lunch, and I'd started some other pills, and when I went to lunch, I felt like a piece of my mind had fallen off. It went dark on me, and something else came in to replace it very quickly, but when I went back to work on the board, I didn't understand my own work. It was gone. So it took me three more days to refigure it from the new position of wherever I was coming from. So this stuff, you know, you know if you're going to do drugs, don't do hormones. They're really <laughs> dangerous, okay? <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, I love what happened to me. So, um, okay, so that was the magic moment. Now, this goes real fast through here. From that, we started having the idea that if we wanted to deal with psychology, like uh, Scrooge, we should start going ahead and taking notes of all the kinds of things that had to do with psychology and stories. Uh, the main character psychology. We figured, let's deal with the main character psychology. So we started looking at every story we could think of, and we put everything that looks psychological on post-it notes until we had a room this size again filled on all four walls with post-it notes. And then I started taking those notes and saying, well, these kind of seem like they go together. What well, can, need, what should kind of seem to go together. You know, things like that. And so we started pulling things together, sometimes in twos, sometimes threes, sometimes eights. We had all kinds of stuff. And finally we realized that we were beginning to build groups of four. And we knew, knew we had TKAD and can, need, want, should. And we started saying, well, maybe that four thing kind of is the best way to organize things. Maybe when you have four things, you've sort of like got all the bases covered. So we started looking for these groups of four, and we find sometimes three. And from that, we could say, well, if those three are in here and they're related this way, we could actually kind of calculate what the fourth one needed to be to, to fix it up. I'll tell you right now, jumping ahead, a single quad is a narrative. A single quad is a narrative. It's the smallest story you can tell. Anything that has less than four items arranged in a quad pattern that have the relationships that I'll be talking about a little bit later, anything that has less than four can't be a story because it's not a complete argument. But when you take the quads and you create something that has four quads at the top and you go four levels down, and there's a reason for that. It's all this space, time, and and permutations and it's the size the maximum size that the human mind can hold an idea where it can see the largest details at the same time it sees the smallest details it's like if you have a, a railroad track like this and you've got ties on it and you can only see four ties okay you can move a car it can only cover four ties up and down the track but you're never going to see more than four ties when you look underneath it so that's what the human mind is. It's not the you know speed of light constant. In the mind, it's the size of mind constant. And you can only look four wide and four deep. If you look any deeper, you cannot hold the big picture in your head at the same time. You can go back to it, keep it in memory. You just can't hold it in your conscious mind at the same time because of the number of dimensions we have to deal with. What are the four dimensions that are four high and four down? Knowledge, thought, ability, desire, and mass, energy, space, and time. The inner world and the outer world the inner equivalent of the outer world. I'll jump ahead a little bit here because uh, I just love this stuff. We're talking about mind and universe and physics coming up here anyway on the, uh, the chart. I'll just jump a little bit ahead because we were talking about things like this. And basically, knowledge is the mass of the mind. Uh, thought is the energy of the mind. And uh, ability is the space of the mind. And desire is the time of the mind. Why? Because knowledge is the unit, like mass is. Energy is the force, like thought is. Energy and mass have <coughs> two relationships. One of them is where you can say you can rearrange pieces of mass using energy to build bricks into a wall. You can create something. Okay, that's kinetic energy. Another thing you can do is you can transmute energy into mass, mass into energy, as Einstein said, with E equals mc squared. And when you do, 
you can take a little bit of mass can generate an awful lot of energy but it takes a tremendous amount of energy to make just one little piece of mass and similarly in the mind a little bit of knowledge can generate an awful lot of thought but a lot of thought is required to arrive at a true piece of knowledge now I won't go into the rest of this at the time that's for another class maybe or later in the day here if we have enough time but it turns out that the equations that Einstein described out here are very similar to the equations that we found with KTAD, the one I woke up with, okay? And if you use simple algebra, they actually begin to look a lot alike because we're describing four dimensions of the mental universe and four dimensions of the material universe. And in so doing, they're reflections of each other. Why? Because the brain is made out of stuff. And with a brain made out of stuff in a four-dimensional world, then a process that is created called self-awareness is no surprise that it should project those four dimensions as well into the process world which creates the mind. Because it is built in the brain which exists in these, the process it generates has four perspectives as well. And that's one of the reasons there's a quad. There's a zillion of them, but we have an upcoming class that's Secrets of the Quad, two hours on a Monday night coming up. You'll see it in the list at... Uh, at storymind.com slash classes, and you uh, can attend that one if you want. That's all free, and we'll talk in depth about the quad. So, we started coming up with uh, the post-it notes, and we started to put them together into quads, and at some point we looked at them and we said, there are some things here that don't pertain to the main character. There are psychological aspects that maybe pertain to other characters. Does every character have this kind of psychological stuff? This is before we knew there was a main character that have all these considerations and all the other people are like archetypes kind of, you know. So we looked at it and said, no, there's not enough for other characters and they're not the same kinds of things as the main character. And I was sitting there looking at the board. Uh, if this was the room, I was looking at that side with the whiteboards here. And as I stood there, I looked at it, I moved, I stood about halfway in the room and I stared at it and I had this eureka moment. I said, maybe these aren't psychological aspects of the characters. Maybe it's the psychology of the story itself. Maybe the story has a mind of its own. Maybe it's like another character. The, the character is the story, and these are the psychological aspects of the, the mind. So I ran down the hall into Chris's office, and I explained all this to him. And he said, wait a minute. And then he did what he usually did when I came to him with the theory idea. He laid flat on the floor, prone like this, closed his eyes, and did not move for about 30 seconds, 40 seconds. And he says, I think you're right. Okay, which is how it usually went. Chris could never deal with theory when he was upright. In order to deal with theory, he was bring him this crazy idea, and he would have to lay down wherever he was, you know, middle of the office walkway from the water cooler to the restroom, and he'd lay down, you know. It's like he had narcolepsy. I mean, he was trying to close everything down and let his mind go blank so that he could then completely capture the essence of what I was talking about theory-wise and then, and then grasp it and, and judge whether he thought it was right or not. So he said, yeah, yeah, that was pretty much what he thought it was, uh, too. And from that point forward, we went back and started rearranging the charts. We started putting things in, in groups. And uh, initially, we had big flat charts where we had all these groups laid out in a line. We were still thinking linearly. We had like a quad after a quad after a quad after a quad after a quad. And it was like this long and gamely thing. Chris somewhere still has some, um, a thing called writer's blocks before there was the software, which is a series of children's blocks. And he put some of these names all around the four sides of blocks and put them on a, on a string. And then you could take that and you could turn them and make different combinations of these blocks so that you could see maybe we could figure out the order of things that were happening in the story. Because we ended up with all kinds of patterns. We were looking at things and we were getting Z patterns moving through these quads. And we were getting them in different orientations and we were getting C patterns or U patterns, depending on how you turned it. And then we had the infamous hairpin, which blew our minds. Why would it cross its own path uh, in a sequence? Uh, we tried different visualizations. Chris had his writer's blocks, and here's something that's a treat for just you people here today. Jim's the first one to get to hold it. Uh -oh. This is one of the first visualizations of Dramatica <laughs> that now has become the Dramatica chart that you all know. It is conceptually a toroid wrapped by a Mobius strip which passes four times around it before it comes back to its own tail and reconnects so that it's both endless in its pathway and at the same time seen from the edge as opposed to going about it linearly it is 
um, a complete cycle, a closed system. So it's a closed system here, it's a closed system the other way, but this is seen linearly as it travels all the way through here and red eventually becomes gold, becomes, okay, green, and so on. And then the names that we have on the walls are stuck right on here where they belonged according to that rate. And what you would do is say, here is this quad and this quad has meaning, okay, by looking at those, those points, should hold that up. This, this, that, that would then become a quad that had meaning. And you know what? This is probably still the most accurate visual, visualization of what's going on in Dramatica ever made, okay? But it's impossible to use, and I'm not sure I fully understand it myself, but I think it's the most accurate. Okay, Jim, you're the first Whoa, one to hold it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that hasn't seen lead day in 25 years. That was back in, in what, 91, okay? So, anyway, we tried visualizing different ways, and we had, like I said, these long, 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 long chains of quads and we said, well, it goes like this, and then it goes from here up to here, and then it goes like that, and then down here and around that way, and it was like, it looked like a mouse trying to get out of a maze. And we were having so much trouble with it. And so, finally, we said, what the heck are we going to do with this? And we realized that if we put them into pyramids, the items into pyramids, because those days we didn't know about uh, the four classes. We thought there were only two. We thought we were just dealing in the story mind with universe and mind, okay? And back there is the back side of it. We thought we had one for universe and another one just like that for mine. And one of them was the main character and the other one was the, the world that he was fighting. It was that simple. And there were two of them. The uh, problem we had with that was Chris went to great lengths to build these with all of the different uh, items that we, we had. And he, uh, he put them together and uh, we had elements on the bottom by that time. Okay, uh, 64 of them. And we figured out that's the way it went. But when we did that, we said, well, if this and this are two different perspectives, it's the same thing. The universe perspective of the inequity, the dissonance, and the mind perspective of the same dissonance, then if we put them together, they should match up. But the only problem is that when you look at them from the top in universe, what's up here, when you look at it in mind, it's also up there. But that's impossible because if you put these together, it's over here. When you actually take those two and put them together, it's going to create a mirror image. It didn't work. <laughs> and that was a bad way to visualize it. So what we did was Chris one day came in with the four towers and he said, oh, I thought of something. And he came up with these four towers. He's great with visuals. And so the four towers became what we dealt with. And then we compressed them all down so that we'd see them easily in the flat chart that people look at, which becomes just kind of a shopping list of, of elements. And in some of our practical classes, I'll tell you, uh, like I was talking to Jose the other day, about how if you're doing a short story, you can just go in and circle everything you want on that flat chart that you think you, is going to be in your story. And eventually you'll find, absolutely, if you created a story world or a story concept, that you'll have a bunch of outliers here and there and here, but there'll be a, a globular cluster, some place where you see you're choosing a lot of things from this area. What that means is, these things don't belong in the story. They belong in your subject matter, but not in the same narrative because they can't fit. The globular cluster gives you an idea of what part of the overall uh, Dramatica towers, what part of that model of, of narrative you're going to want in the size of story you're telling. So if you're telling a short story, making a short film, doing a song, once you find what that is, then you want to make sure that you carve out only that section of the structure. You don't have to do a complete structure. A single quad is a narrative. But if you say all these things are what I want to have, then you carve those out and that becomes the size of your narrative for this short story. And the key is, as long as you don't go outside those quads, then the story will feel like you're making a small argument completely. But if you use any of these outliers you want to put in, it looks like you're trying to make a bigger argument and failing to make it completely. So your audience won't buy it, your readers won't buy it, your people listening to your song won't buy it. So if you're going to do something short form, it doesn't matter. We used to call it slicing and dicing. Yeah, you can slice down this tower and take that, like slicing a cake, you know, anything you want. You A layer cake. You can take off layers. You can dice it, okay? So the end up with slicing and dicing, and you can take any chunk you want of any size you want, and that's true. But the better way to use it in a practical sense, so this is an idea of what you get in practical classes we're going to do, is to just simply circle all the things that are of interest, you know, on a Xerox copy of that thing, and you'll end up with a clump. And that clump is where your story belongs if you're doing short form. So there's just a little tip right there. Okay, so we, uh, we had all that, and we got the towers, and the problem was that we didn't know how we could resolve these strange zigzag patterns 
because we kept trying to plot the zigzag patterns on the uh, on the chart, and even with the four towers looking at it, we, we couldn't figure out why some went like this and that. And when you look at a, a quad that has four items in it, you know why it made that pattern, or why it did this pattern, or why it did that pattern, and why the orientation of the pattern was. There was no reason to it, and so another strange event happened. You know, like we've had so many eureka moments. First, there's the the equation itself. Then there's the the uh, moment of it's a mind of the story, a story mind. Wow! <laughs> and then I went with my daughter to Exposition Park uh, in LA and to the Museum of Science and History. And they had an exhibit there. They had like 21 magnets, bar magnets, north south, and they were all on a uh, a big piece of um, two by four. And they were each mounted on a um, a little central uh, axis spike, and you could turn them. And if you turn the very slowly, you could turn a magnet all the way around and it wouldn't affect any of the others in the row. And if you turn really fast, then it wouldn't affect all the other magnets in the row because it would go past them before they could move past the friction. But if you turned at just the right speed, you could get the next one to turn. And if you continued to turn at just the right speed, you could get it so all 21 magnets were moving at the same time by turning one. And I looked at that and she was having so much fun with it and I said, <laughs> You know this line years later from this moment I'm talking about in the first Star Trek movie by Abrams where Scotty says, funny, it never occurred to me that space was the thing that was moving, okay? It never occurred to me that it was the model that was moving. At that moment when I saw these magnets, I said, Chris, it's not a fixed thing that you plot stuff on. It moves like a Rubik's Cube. It twists, it turns, you know? It slices, it dices. Now how much would you pay? Wait, there's more. Okay, so the thing is, Chris was really taken with that. He instantly saw the truth of it, and we sat down and we started working out, well, how does this work? Well, sometimes you can flip. You can flip along this axis. You can rotate. What does that mean? Rotating changes the sequence in which problem-solving techniques are used. Flipping puts one in the forefront and puts the other on the back burner. When you flip, I've tried to solve this problem with logic all my life, and I couldn't solve it with logic. It's a matter of the heart. Why well, you should follow your heart. Oh, I'll try feeling. You put feeling out there, and what's happened? You flip logic into the back position in your head. When you come to this kind of a situation, you're no longer going to put logic first, which is natural to do, because these situations, they require putting feeling first. So you flip. But when you're saying, which of these things should I approach first, sometimes you're boiling water. If you boil water and you put in the noodles, that works. If you put the noodles in the water and then try to boil, you get mush. So sometimes the order in which you do things has an impact. Okay, just like we often talk about, you know, a scream followed by a slap is different than a slap followed by a scream. A slap followed by a scream, ow! A scream followed by a slap, ah! Brings somebody to their senses. I learned that in the editing business that you could take the exact same pieces of film that have been shot, change their order around, and get a completely different meaning. Yeah. Uh, speaking of order, I had a question. Um, now, what did you guys come up with first, and in what order? The elements? Because the elements blow my mind. We came up with them all at the same time, and the reason we came up with them all at the same time is they were all psychological things we were putting on the wall, yeah. and we didn't know that some of them turned out to be of a different magnitude. Some of them were like a name for a family, like the rare earths or the uh, noble gases in chemistry. You know, you kind of find them. Chlorine and fluorine, you know, they're very similar in their characteristics. They're part of the same family, but they're not exactly the same. Well, we realized that quads describe the family of things where you actually dealt with the mass, energy, space, time, or the knowledge, thought, ability, desire. And when you covered all four of them, you had a quad. And depending on the perspective you had on it, that quad might be about hope versus dream, or it might be about logic versus feeling and have those things in and some others. So we actually did them all at once and made all the quads at once, and then we started arranging them as to which one was a family name and which family or families belonged underneath it, and then did that family actually belong underneath a larger family as a subfamily, and so it took a long time to actually build those pyramids and then build the charts, and then at that point we pretty much had everything set up, but it actually took about two years to come up with all the names uh, by calculating, first trying to figure out which ones were families and what they were, and we didn't know how many levels it was up or down, you know, it was four. I mean, it's after we build it, it's like Crick and Watson, they got these industrial tinker toys to try and describe in chemistry what they were seeing in, in the way DNA works, what they knew about it, and it took them a long time, and finally put it together, and when they did, they said, well, this is elegant, and it explains everything we know, 
but they went at it in a touchy-feely way based on knowledge of what they were trying to describe. And we did the same thing with this chart. We went a touchy-feely way of trying to come up with something that actually described what we were seeing, what we knew about, and eventually we saw what the level was, what the breadth was, what the depth was. Without the towers, we never could have done that. It was Chris's notion of the towers that allowed us to go from the universe and mind, ultimately, as we were starting to work on these other things, to find which ones were which. But So the elements, some of them were invented right at the beginning, some of the top levels were invented right at the beginning, others came later as we continued to put it together and, and fill in, like, you know, Hi, Mr. DNA, we're going to put this frog DNA and get you a dinosaur by filling in the gaps. Well, we had all these quads and we filled in gaps by calculating what had to be there based on what was around it, okay? And uh, sort of like they do with planets. Oh, it's something's there because it's making a wobble, okay? The quads, there's something there and we know what it is because of what's around it and we could figure out what had to be there. And then which came first, the, the, um, the example you spoke about, the, the model movement? Mm-hmm versus the relationship between that eureka moment versus all the options and the quads and them being dynamic kind of relationships. Well, the dynamic relationships in the quad were already understood by position that they they represented kind of like a, a nature of them. You had something that was knowledge-like, something that was thought-like, or something that was massive, something that was energetic, something that was spatial, or and, and, and something that was temporal. Space and time they were a whole different level of thinking above mass and energy. They were more complex. And we knew that every quad had to have one line that was a simple line and one line that was a more complex line. So it was sort of like you took, you know, mass and energy, and then you turned it around and said, now we're moving them both up to become space and time. You know, it was kind of like that feeling so that you had a sense that one of these things was like uh, primary colors and the other items in the quad were one level up into some of the shadings. And it was only later that we realized each quad is one step up when, by the time you go through it to make a quad of quads and that each time you move to another quad you've actually moved upwards a little in a spiral uh, as you move up. Um, more on that on the quad class. It's too deep to go into tonight but, uh, but basically a lot of this stuff happened concurrently but the moment about it moving happened after we had the four towers and we already had pretty much all of the names put in. That's when we came up with the idea of, of actually using it like a Rubik's Cube. Oh, and just a side note, why it's like a Rubik's Cube? Picture a Rubik's Cube held together by rubber bands. And every time you twist and turn it, there's a ratchet. So you go through life experience and you respond to things that somebody doesn't like the way you act or you talk or a word that you use, a mother, you know, your, your classmates, a, a teacher. And you learn that if you don't do that, you avoid punishment, and if you do things that you on your own wouldn't do, you get praise. So we all begin to adjust ourselves to the world around us, to the experiences that we have, and every time we do that, ratchet, twist, turn, flip, rotate, and it's all, in, you know, <laughs> so many things have an impact on us until we tighten this up, because once you've turned it, it ratchets and can't turn back the way it came in. And so you get all these rubber bands there, that's dramatic tension. And we have a story form, it's everything is twisted up as tight as it can get, and it's formed something that is immutable. And when you have something that's immutable, then that's when the influence character comes in, and they're able to do the Gordian knot thing and take it apart piece by piece until the main character either is changed by the experience or faces the fact that they made a bad assumption at the bottom of their pyramid of knowledge. Okay, Because everything is a justification. We look at something and we say, this thing at the bottom, we've seen that happen all the time. This leads to that, this leads to that, this leads to that. And there's two kinds of that. Where there's smoke, there's fire. That's a spatial one. They exist together. See smoke? You got fire. Even if you don't see the fire. Smoke, fire, smoke, fire. They coexist. The other one is the if-then one, which is the temporal one. And that says uh, one bad apple spoils a bunch. Okay, That's temporal. It's going to happen. Okay, It hasn't happened already. So we have these two kinds of logic, spatial and temporal logic, that we use. And based on seeing things repeatedly, we then say that's always true. And then we say if it's always true, well, what if one bad apple spoils the bunch and where there's smoke, there's fire, and we see a smoking apple? Okay, now we have to go to another level of consideration and start saying, well, given that these things are true, what does that mean? Okay, but those things may not always be true. They may only be true in the limited universe we've experienced. They may have been true once, and now the situation's changed. And that's why there's no such thing as an unreasonable prejudice. It's based on the way we're raised, the experiences that we have, Everybody is only responding to try and adjust themselves to all the things they can't remain steadfast on and make the world change to match themselves. And so as we begin to adapt 
and try to adapt our world, eventually all the adaptations we make lock into place, and then we've got ourselves a narrative. Okay? And that's where a grand argument story begins, is how do you unwrap it when the whole mind is twisted up where it has nowhere left to budge, there's no seat left at the table, there's no wiggle room. It's like you get one of those little things that you used to play with that had letters or numbers, and you try to get them in order on those little little uh, squares, if you've ever seen them, and move them around. There always had to be an open space. What if they were all filled? That's what happens when you have them here, but the last one gets filled. Okay, then you're stuck. Then you need an influence character. Okay, yeah. Um, if one side multiplies and the other side divides, did you also have the revolution around the top and the bottom? Well, yeah, actually, it turns out, I'll give you that answer very straight. I mean, it's easy to diverge and give you other answers I'd like to give, but in terms of the top and the bottom, what you really have is the, the top and bottom level there is a quad that goes one, two, three, four sequentially when you look at it, one, two, three, four, from the classes to the types to the variations to the elements, that actually forms a quad. And these two are related in one side uh, dividing and one side multiplying in that way. So that the variations, okay, are uh, related to genre. And that's why theme and genre seem so close together, whereas characters and plot are tied together because they're dynamic pairs, okay? But it's just a sideways one. You're not familiar seeing it that way. But if it wasn't in the model, the model wouldn't work because that's the way the mind works. So actually, that same thing holds true. When you see genre and theme as being two different things, you'll tend to see plot and character as being something that happens simultaneously between the two. And when you see character and plot manipulating each other as being separate, you tend to see theme genre, something that is all blended together between the thematics and the genre elements. That's the way it comes across at a structural level, beneath the level of subject matter, which is a whole other ball of wax. Okay? It's really complicated. That's why these classes are free. <laughs> you can't use any of this shit. Okay? So the thing is that it's all true. Though. It's all true, but it's really not very practical. But it gives you an understanding of what's going on in the mind, in the universe, in the world, in your heart, with somebody else. And if you took enough of these classes, you'd be able to actually start seeing narratives like people see in the Matrix, the code goes by. You don't see people anymore. You don't see events. You don't see the politicians saying this or that. All you see are narratives, and you go, Oh, yeah, yeah. And then people come up to you with problems and issues, and you're just like, <laughs> you know, here, take this narrative, take that narrative. Oh, you're throwing a narrative at me? <laughs> really? You know, and that's what it's like, okay? So narrative is going to solve all the real world's problems. So everybody learned narrative. If everybody learned just the quad, and that's why the class in quad is so important, because if you just learn the quad, you can then apply it to everything. All you need is one quad. Quad is the seed. Quad is the kernel. Quad understanding is the thing that allows you to build the entire grand argument story out of it, but you never really need that in real life. You've got a thousand narratives going all the time. If you can look at anything, look at uh, the strong forces, the weak forces, electromagnetism and gravity, four items. That's what you got to deal with. Uh, how about uh, liquid, solid, gas, and plasma? Four items that you're going to deal with. How about DNA? You've got four bases, okay? Um, why? Why? Because that is the a four-dimensional universe makes that happen, and the mind has to see things in fours. If it sees fewer, it's left something out. If it sees more, it's grouping something in there that doesn't belong and isn't part of the functional narrative. Each narrative, oh, God, you guys get me going here. You know, I mean, I really want to move on to some of the stuff about how it's developed. And here we're talking about some of the outline stuff. It's, it's kind of cool. I can't, I can't help myself. Uh, somebody's thought. You know? So the thing is that when you look at a quad, you know, and you've got all that stuff going on, the quad itself is a little dramatic circuit or a little psychological circuit. Uh, go to YouTube, type in Story Mind, which is my channel there. I've got 340 videos up there. Look for uh, psychological circuit, look for dramatic circuit. Uh, dr uh, dramatic circuit. There's two uh, different videos up there. But basically, one's going to be a potential, one's going to be a resistance, one's going to be a current, the other one's going to be a power or outcome. And in fact, you can take a quad and at the element level, determine all the things that are going to happen in a scene, in any scene, by making sure there's a potential of resistance, a current, and a power. What that does is it says you can do them in any order. Why? Because everything in a quad also has a 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, the 1, 2, 3, and 4 are shifted by the fact that the model is wound up in justification. They're moved out of place. So the sequence is changed by the twists and flips and the rotates. Same thing with the potential resistance and current power. You could start with any one. In other words, these two things don't get shifted together. First, these are mixed up, and then these are mixed up on top of it. Because one's mixed up around the main character, and one's mixed up around the objective story, because it's very likely first thought with universe and mind, 
only it's really main character and objective story, but there's those other towers who influence character and the subject of story. But the justification windups happen between the individual and that and the overall story. And why? <laughs> because every individual has a narrative within themselves of what they're trying to achieve in their lives to find happiness. And every single group mind that they belong to has a group mind narrative in which they are but a facet of the group mind playing the protagonist of voice of reason. We'll talk about that later. And when they do, they have two different jobs. One to be true to themselves, and one to be true to the group in the job that they have. But those are often in conflict. Every single bit of inequity that anybody has in the world is when a group narrative is in dissonance with the personal narrative. And it all comes from these things having potential reasons to turn power and being put out of order. And that order is not compatible with what the group mind wants of you when you're functioning in that role, in the office, in your family, with your children. Okay? Um, it's, it's that differential between the personal narrative and the group narrative that creates all, all of the dramatic tension in the world, in the real world, in the fictional world. Okay. So, um, yeah, swallow that. <laughs> Take that, Buddha, Confucius, and the rest of you sons of bitches. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I get curious sometimes. Uh, all right, so, uh, okay, we talked all about all this stuff, and we had a problem with the elements, which is, when we got down to the elements, we only had 64 names. And we had four towers to put elements under, and we said, what the hell are we going to do? We have 64 names, and we need 256 of them. Well, what are we going to do? We can't come up with it. We've, we've exhausted the English language. And then it suddenly struck us, well, actually, each of these is a different perspective. And what we're doing is looking through these different filters of these four layers. And by the time we get down to the bottom thing, we're really looking at the same thing, like we used to think with the universe tower and the, and the mind tower and trying to put them together by the base. They're all looking at the same thing. But like Chris often says, it's like taking a stick and putting it in a fish tank and walking around the aquarium and trying to determine if the stick is bent or just looks bent. Well, you can't really tell until you've seen all four sides. By the time you've seen all four sides, then you got the image of it, and you know whether it's a bent stick or whether it... Okay, so you have to look at all these perspectives. So what each one of those really is, is it's looking at the same issues, the same 64 elements, down at that character level. And when you do, you're seeing it from four different points of view. And by the time you have, then you're able to quadrangulate how it looks from each of those four points of view so they actually have the same names. But something funny happens. This is almost physics down at the bottom of the elements. This is actually part of what I intend to talk about tonight, strangely. Um, when you get down to the level of the elements, they don't change positions. They stay in pairs, and the pairs change positions with other pairs. So it gets down to the point where it doesn't have total chaos reign, and the elements are moving all over, which I thought it was. I, I had scissors. I was cutting out elements. You know, I had them all over the floor in Chris's office, and I was like moving them around. Maybe they got together this way. Maybe they rotate once to the left. Maybe they this one swaps with that one. Maybe you know, I couldn't figure it out, and it was driving me nuts. And finally, I said, they, they always travel in pairs. Okay, that's the answer. They don't break apart to the point that they get down to the atomic level. They get down to the bipolar molecules of thought. Okay, and when they do, then you end up with logic and feeling always being together, but being matched with different things to measure it against by each of the four perspectives. And by the time you finished, and there's a pattern to it, figured out the pattern, and we gave it to uh, to um, put into the model. Now, the um, the problem was that with all these flips and rotates, after we had the uh, uh, we knew they were flipping, and rotating, we had the elements. Now the question is. What drives the flips and rotates? We knew it did it. What makes that happen? Well, it was nearing Christmas time. There was about a couple of months to go till Christmas. I was going to go away with my family. I was under a lot of pressure. Remember, I'm still in a little transition here. Um, at the point where I was like getting ready to have surgery, you know, <laughs> and my family, am I holding it together? What about my kids? You know, monetary problems, all kinds of things going on. And basically, the guys came to me, you know, with their their usual deep understanding. They're, you know, they're businessmen, and they said. Uh, if you don't figure it out by the end of the year, we're going to pull the plug on the whole project. <laughs> figure out those algorithms. You know. Well, I have to say, they supported me for a long time, and they gave me money, and then they canceled the debt, and they did all kinds of good things, so they were really good for me. But that particular time, they really put me through the air. Basically, I had at that point, it's like two weeks by the time they came to me with the ultimatum, to take all I knew about this stuff and figure out what made these things turn. And here's the answer. <laughs> Here's some of my work that I was doing at the time. 
Oh, let me erase this because that looks, <laughs> it looks like it looked to me <laughs> when I was trying to figure it out. Okay, but here's a sheet of paper, and I'm going to make this available to Jim later, um, where you can see I was figuring out things, and here over in this corner down here, that is the first place I was trying to figure out how these things changed with flips and rotates. Now, Chris and I had, had lunch together, and we knew that if there were flips and rotates, how did it happen? And we realized that if we, and we had a map again, I wish we'd saved it, I had it for years, I think it's gone now, but it might turn up. I can always fake it and put it on eBay, so mm -hmm. you know, but um, K-T-A-D, <laughs> but if you flip it, you get K-T-A-D, and if you flip that down, you get D, you know, okay. So you go through these permutations, and then you take that whole thing, and you flip that, and then you flip that, and you flip that, and when you do, you get the whole chart, and it runs out of all the permutations by the time you've gone through four levels. So it's sort of like a second proof for how it works, is that you get all the possible combinations. It turns out there are eight basic equations. Each one represents an archetype's thought patterns, okay, which is another side note. But this area here was when I was beginning to figure out what makes it rotate to the right or the left. Why does it flip along this line or along that line? Which one happens? And then eventually, here's what we ended up with. Uh, this is what I did in that last two weeks. The call of failure must be able to reorder the above quads to the following alignment. You see, this and this have changed position, but these have stayed where they were. And here, this and this have changed position, but these have stayed where they were. And here, both and neither have stayed there, but space and time have changed where they were. So in the case of a failure story, what it basically means is everything logistically is working against itself, and it's not going to succeed. Okay, um, The reasoning is obscure. I've forgotten most of it. This document is lost presently <laughs> that has all of them explained. But the original version of Dramatica, the story engine, only had 28K in the programming. And it also had all of the text explaining why these things were done. Here's how it worked. I went into the room and I would tell Chris like this, well, this is what failure is. It has to mean that these things do that. And the reason it is is because such and such and such and such. And then Chris would say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I understand that. Uh, okay, Steve, what's happening is the, uh, you know, and they'd start talking about programming language. The table A is actually exchanging relative positions with table B so that the operations that it contains are going to occur in a different order because of this, you know, flips and rotates, whether it takes... Uh, you know, uh, both or neither, space or time is involved, whether it's flipping or rotating, all of these things were decided. And then Steve would translate it to the final step, and he'd write the code, you know, uh, and he'd put it in C++, whatever the code would be. We do a presentation. We actually show that code at some point, and it's really interesting. Uh, you can see it. In fact, they print out the whole code in the, uh, in the patent. So if you ever look up the patent, you can see the code. But it doesn't contain the code that does this. That's what's missing in the patent. Steve realized in those early days that the computer was just not fast enough to do what we wanted to do because they were very slow processors in those days. And even though the engine was only 28K in size, it worked the way the mind worked, which means, as I was telling Jim the other day, you think about something and you go through the process and you go, oh, that train of thought didn't work. I should be going a different direction with it. So then you decide to try it this way. The only problem is your mind remembers having done it this way, so it's not the same as if you'd done it first the other way, because you already carry the memory of having done it this way, okay? As a result of it, the mind picks up this uh, uh, retrograde and anterograde interference from decisions you've made before and the one you're going to make next that alters the way you remember the one that you just had. That's part of the beauty of the mind, it's chasing its own tail all the time, okay? That's the way the mind works, that's the way the original engine worked in 28K, amazingly efficient. But it took forever because you'd make one change and it would go and it took like you know twenty minutes to run a story for him, you know, if you knew all the choices and you put them in. It's terrible. So Steve and his brilliance, and this is what we actually got the patent for, not the way it actually works, which is the trade secret, it's the intellectual property. It's never been published, and I don't even have a copy. Okay. And I won't remember it, so you can't kidnap me either. Well you can, but you won't get anything. Anyway, so the thing is that out of all this, uh, it goes on and on, and it goes deeper and deeper, and there's like t 10 pages of this so far that explain how these things happen and why, okay? Um, what he did was he said, well, if we know what all the end results are, we can actually say that because it's a closed system and we know how big the chart is, we could work out a gigantic table that would have all the results in it, and then it would do an advantage. 
as people make choices, we just X out the parts of the table that didn't have those choices in it. You know, it's like a big cross-reference table, okay? And better than that, if somebody changed their mind, they could back out of their choice because, well, if this is no longer X'd off, then all these things become available. And then he created the story engine. That was his brilliance, is that if you actually do it linearly like the mind does it, which changes the experience for the mind, you don't need the experience when you're trying to figure out what the structure is. You need the experience when you're trying to work through something in your own mind. In software, you just want to know what the answer is. And so in that case, this table enabled that to happen. And that became the version that has been released. There's never been any of this stuff released. Okay, that's all held back. Um, so uh, after that, all we had to do is build all the tools around the software. You know, what are we going to do? We're going to create characters. What do you know about characters? Well, here's the plots. Here's the relationships among the characters based on their elements. And it just, you know, it was work. The invention had been done. And then we had to write the book. Finally, instead of wordsmith or story, we had to sit down and uh, basically, Chris and I would talk, I'd sit down and I'd, I'd write the book. I was always the writer, he was always the editor, and it was always our work. So everything we did together, uh, our names were on both of it. I wrote the words, he edited the words, we came up with the concepts. Neither one of us could have done it without the other. I mean, you know, uh, sometimes he was ahead of me in theory. Mostly I've been ahead of him on theory. He's been ahead of me on organization, how to present it, visualization. I never caught up to that. Uh, but between the two of us, we've been able to create what we have here. Now. All of that then was great until we were two weeks away from releasing the very first version of Dramatica. And I realized that the elements had to move 90 degrees from where they were in everything two weeks before we released. Because we had not counted on the vertical quad that we looked at earlier. And if it's a vertical quad, then that last item is always going to be a little bit out of left field. And here's why. What's really happening when you go through a quad is that you're doing this. Every quad you go through, like a slinky. You look at it from the end, it looks like a circle. You know, it's sort of like trigonometry. Okay? Um, and you can look at it as going around and around and around. You look at it from the side, and it's a sine wave. That's the temporal aspect. This is the spatial aspect. The thing is, though, that because we like to see things in Western society, spatial, that's what's called K-based system, knowledge-based system. Everything is based on K and grows from there. You can have a T-based system, a D-based system, an A-based system. But here in the West, it's a K-based system that was on market, so we built the first model, which is was based on K. And so when we look at this here, and we see that it appears to go around in a circle, what's really happening is it's rising up, and you're not going full circle, you're going full spiral from here up until here, where you actually have this vertical elevation. Now, it's actually rising all the way along a little bit, but when we're trying to look at things in the world without time involved, just like the mind has to go through the process and the software uses a table, you're trying to not use the temporal and see what it is. You sweep all that under the carpet until you get to the last one where you just can't sweep it under anymore because there's too much left over. And so you put it all into the last item. So in a quad, if you look at them as four items in a row, it's no longer one side multiplies the other divides, or one side's blended and the other side seems as discrete. What it really is, is that there's this progressive build, but you don't see it in the words. The words seem like, which of these things is not like the others? This looks like it, this looks like it, this looks like it. Then we hit, you know, liquid, solid, gas, plasma, okay? You know, it's not, it's not good. We, we go through... Electromagnetism, strong forces, weak forces, gravity, you know, it, it comes in there as something that's a little out of left field, a little wanky, okay, because it's picking up all the slack, because we're trying to look at them as four things on a flat plane, and they aren't, they're actually elevated, so it picks up that vertical slack, and that vertical slack in this case meant that the elements all had to be shifted 90 degrees from where they were, so poor Steve, who had everything set up, and they were about to go to a gold master and send it out to the people who were going to make the whole thing and send out thousands of copies, he had to go through there and shift everything frantically, and he told me later that the way he felt about it, it worked pretty good up until that point. And he was amazed that it could do the things that it did. But when that 90 degree shift was put in there, everything just clicked. And from that point, it worked perfectly. So everything has to be a quad. Without a quad, you're not looking at it the right way. And we ignored the vertical quad, which would have that twist in it by the time you got down to the bottom. That's where the helix comes into it. Okay. So anyway. Uh, uh, no, you yeah. said uh, it goes in a spiral direction. What uh, point of view are you speaking about? The audience, the way they 
we see the merity? No, I'm talking about the actual nature of the elements themselves have a spiral progression of what they are. Mm -hmm. um, that you can actually look at. There's a thing called a breadth first order and a depth first order when you're doing a wind up uh, like we were doing to flip and rotate. And you start at the problem element level of one class and you flip it and rotate and then you go up to the next level and you move around so that by the time you get to the top you're, you're actually taking a helical pattern. That happens also in the other wind up. So it's double helix. Okay, it's not really a double helix like DNA. It's actually a quad helix because two of them are virtual, which is the time frame, and two of them are spatial. That's why they're going to probably discover in DNA that you have the, the spatial DNA, which tells you this is the genome. It is the genetic sequence of where things are placed that is the blueprint for a creature. But the two missing helices are the virtual ones that say this is how it will grow, which they don't know yet. And if they, if they figure them out, uh, what makes it actually grow, in what order this will be done, what order this will come online, what order that will happen, that's the missing thing in DNA science right now. And in fact, that'll turn out to also follow the helical pattern as a double helix. And that that double helix, uh, virtual double helix of the conceptual nature of what happens in what order in the growth of the atom is like taking the difference between a blueprint, which is the double helix of DNA, and sending a worker out to build the building. That's the part that they haven't got yet. That's also going to turn out to be a double helix, I imagine. Okay, I'm in here well. So, uh, after that, that was the last element swap. Now, at this point, we're going to take a little break. The rest of it goes very quickly. I will uh, read you a poem. Those of you who need to go to the bathroom can go. This poem describes everything about the creation of Dramatica. I wrote it for that. It's called Verbatim. And I will read it, and anybody who's here online, if anybody's here online. Otherwise, in the recording, you can hear it. But if you need to take a break and get some snacks or whatever, um, here you go, Verbatim. Have you ever wished you had something to say to open the heart or capture the day, to dissect the mind or rally the cause, but your words come up empty like stasis on pause? So you put up your website, you type in your word, a mouthpiece for gurus who want to be heard, H-E-R-D. You stamp out a template, you auction your wear that builds them a stairway for climbing up air. You translate their yearnings, transfigure their muse with a medium message divine in its use. Yet a lukewarm reception devours your spiel consumed and digested by the zombies of zeal. For years you persist in your nebulous quest towards a furious sound of infinite jest, and you never look back as your life passes by to present as reflections not seen through your eye. But one day you wake with a pain in your gut that your fame is a fake and your mountain a rut, so you fall from the sky till your life's on the level, to lie in your bed while embracing the devil, and you sing with the sirens a glorious wail, obscuring the sight of the visioner's grail and the auctioneer's gavel indentures the muse and takes a percentage of all whom she screws. But one day she dies, consumed with a clap, and her audience cries as it lays in your lap, and you cradle its head as it cradles yours, and you wish you were dead, save the proceeds from tours. But it isn't the money, nor is it the fame, and it never was simply the name of the game, and it isn't the inside of getting there first, nor the common law near marriage of better and worst, you keep scratching your head till it coughs up the thought in a hope that tastes better than those that you bought. You savor the flavor that burns through your tongue, for truth leaves you speechless and breathless and young. And the answers you sought with obtuse nomenclature turn out to be more of a personal nature. So the final few words of this self-focused work the right answers for me. <laughs> and that's my experience with Radica. Anyway, when we come... If you want to continue now, if you need a break, I don't know, but, um, you know, a little biological break. Did you create that um, with um, time post and journey? Um, everything I do is influenced by Dramatica, but none of it is actually structured by Dramatica, except for one poem that I'll read to you a little bit later. It's very short, but it's where I wanted to actually show what if I took the four um, points of view and I made a poem out of those. And what would it be? And so, uh, just as an exercise, and then after we go through another one of these sections, I'll present that. Right. Um, yeah, it's out that way. You need a key, key. and uh, it's on the left-hand side. Just go down the hall. Both, yeah, they both work, male and <laughs> Okay. Um, I guess we should probably continue. Well, yeah, you wait, want to wait till like wait back. back unless we have time for that. You guys, you guys like you know have to race out here at nine thirty or something. Okay, good. Then we'll go through all this stuff tonight, and it shouldn't take that long. Any questions while we're waiting? Anything comes to mind? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know if there's an easy answer for this, but as you're um, as you dive into the uh, the table in the chart, yeah, for the quads to sort of discern whether it's a big story for it or, uh -huh. or short. How sure. do you read? How do you validate your asking? Uh, or actually, how do you ask the chart for validation? Does that make sense? Well, sure, it does. Uh, the main thing is when you're See, the way, that, uh, the way that the software is created asks you to be a structuralist first. It wants you to decide uh, where is your objective story, you know, what's the domain of your main character. You can go out of order, but everything's very structural. And if you don't know anything about what your story is at first, uh, then you might really easily get frustrated and confused and unable to answer the question accurately because you don't really know yet those answers. Uh, which is one reason why I created Dramatica, uh, created um, Storyweaver about 12 years ago, was to go to the passion site so people could create their stories world, who's in it, what happens to them, what it means. Uh, people before they became characters, events before they became plot, values before they became theme, and the overall mood of the piece before it became a genre. If they had that first, then they could come to Dramatica informed, and then they could make some choices along the, the structural line. But I often told people in the old days with Dramatica Pro before we reached uh, Story Expert is to go first to the story points window before you even story form. And it lists all of the different story points like the benchmark and, uh, and uh, unique ability of the main character and uh, critical flaw and things like that. And to see if you can answer any of those things based on what you know about your story. And then after you've got that information in, it will show up when you go into story forming It'll show up that this is the storytelling you already did, and it will help inform your choice structurally. So I suggest always first doing a download of what you know in the storytelling sense, and then going into the story structuring sense and looking at what you wrote about your storytelling choices and seeing if you can figure it out from that. Because trying to pull it out of your head is, is really painful and, and very hard for a lot of people. Unless you're James A. Michener or someone like that who likes every little nut and bolt tightened before he puts any flesh on the skeletons. You know, so he would. All right, well, we're back, and um, we're going to be dramatic in the present. You heard about it all happened. It was kind of a wild, crazy ride. It was very, very hard, very sad, a lot of tears, a lot of laughter, uh, a lot of funny anecdotes that you've only heard a portion of, uh, and basically beating our heads against the wall. But for three years, it was a million dollars worth of R&D at the time, in 1991 was for a small company of this when you looked at the overhead and the space we took and everything was a million dollars that they spent building this and uh, that was a hell of a, uh, a thing to be able to be supported for three years to sit around eight hours a day 40 hours a week trying to figure out how stories worked no nobody ever had the luxury before no university would pay for a thing like hey i had to go out and teach classes and stuff so you know <laughs> it's the real world they expect results all right so, um, Dramatica in the present. We've got Dramatica now. It's, it's 1991 through 94. We're releasing various versions of it. And what do we have with Dramatica today? Well, we have a new element. We'll talk about it in a minute. It's Dramatica in the real world. You see, the thing is that Dramatica exists in the real world because of the fact that the, when, when people come together in a room, they self-organize as a group moment. And the way it happens is that each one of us has within us things like reason, skepticism, uh, self-confidence, uh, a conscience. We use all of those. Those are our primary colors. And we can divide them into small elements, but those are the archetypes of our mind, as it were. And we use them to solve our own issues. But when we come together for a group issue, something of group concern, whether it's good, bad, or problem to be solved, or just an area of interest, the group will self-organize so that someone will emerge as the voice of reason. Another person will emerge as the group's skeptic. Someone else will become the conscience for the group. And basically, you'll end up finding very quickly that all the archetypes are represented within the group mind. And so, each individual, in addition to having a full complement for themselves, in the group mind, they also uh, represent a facet, just like a character represents a facet of the story mind. Why? Because the voice of reason can spend all his time thinking about reason and see much deeper than if he had to do all those other jobs also. And so with all these specialists around the table, the group mind gets greater depth and resolution on any issue than if it was a bunch of general practitioners all trying to do the same thing. That's the value of having a group. The group mind also has an identity. Uh, sometimes it's personified like Steve Jobs and Apple. Okay, 
um, we did a job recently where it was for a sports team that didn't have an identity. They had a bunch of high-paid players, but they didn't have any core identity. And so we worked out with the personalities involved and the managers, knowing about the manager, how they could go about having an identity merge. Having an identity emerge doesn't happen instantly. Lydia got its freedom, but it still hasn't gelled into a group mind, an identity. Like, I'm an American, or I'm a Californian, or I'm a Republican, or a Democrat, or whatever. When you adopt that, it's because there's an organization, and you say, I am, you know, like this group mind, or I am in favor of this group mind, or this group mind represents my interests, or how I see the world. Okay? And it happens like a gas is forming a solar system. It moves, and it moves, and it moves, and at some point, the sun sparks. And when the sun sparks, that's the group identity. And when the group identity happens, then all the planets around it start to emerge, and those are the archetypes that will sit around the boardroom table. We had a guy that we did uh, with the government who came and studied with us for about a week, and he was really sharp. He'd been like in covert ops in Afghanistan and over borders. He was not allowed legally to be over, and <laughs> he was a real interesting guy, and uh, very very humble, very personable. I, I love the government people, and not at all like I imagine from all the movies I've seen. <laughs> They're dedicated, and they'll give their lives to their country, and they'll give their lives for each of us. Um, it's, and they work these miserable hours for miserable pay. But um, he studied, and he said he liked the whole idea about people naturally forming the group, and he played poker with people once a week. And so he went in, and he started figuring out who consistently took which archetypal role. And on his own, he decided that if I took this person who's kind of not so strong-willed and took their archetypal position, then they'd be off their game all night because they couldn't be doing the job because I'd start doing it. I'd act like they were acting in terms of the archetypes. And he then would do that, and that person would then try to find somebody else and push them out of place. And by the time he'd finished, he'd gotten everybody off their game except for him who knew what was going on. He started winning and winning and winning because people are comfortable with archetypes. So the thing is, even though in, a, in an ideal world, people come together and form these archetypes uh, uh, you know, that they take the positions of. In the real world, somebody has enough power, enough clout, um, friends who vote for him, uh, somebody who has a strong personality will adopt a role that maybe he's totally not suited for and emerges the voice of reason in the group when he hasn't got a clue how to figure out anything through critical thinking. He just wanted the job, okay? This is how a lot of corporations will work. This is how a lot of sports teams work. This is how a lot of political parties work, is that people end up with the jobs they can leverage that they'd like to have, not the roles, archetypal roles, that they would be best at. Because in reality, often we have a talent that we hate using. And the thing we love to do, we're just no freaking good at. Okay? It happens all the time. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do what you're bad at, if you like it. You know, there's a commercial right now where a guy says, he is terrible at golf. And he says, yes, and I'd like to be terrible at golf for many more years because, you know, I'll keep my heart safe. You know, that's the same kind of thing. We want to do what we want to do. So in an ideal world, you know, looking at physics, everybody would, you know, here's the voice of reason. Here's this. Here's this. Thousands of generations of storytellers, they figured that out. They looked at that. They didn't understand what was going on, but they saw that things always work. These certain character types always emerge, and sometimes they mix them up with the storytelling. You've got the crone, you've got the this, you've got the that, you know, the wise one, whatever. Okay, they worked, but underneath it all, there are these basic human traits that were always there. And all it took was seeing a story in mind, and if you look at it from that standpoint and look back at these conventions of story structures that took literally a thousand generations, 30,000 years to emerge, and now with all the storytelling and all the media we have, narrative is, is, there's so much more of it than there ever was. Narrative and it's refined itself. That's why movies are getting better. That's why books are getting better. Because people are getting a better intuitive sense. But it reflects us. It reflects us as individuals. And it reflects how we work in groups. And that's what became story structure. And that's what we ended up mapping quite by accident and then discovering the meaning of it there. So it turns out that when you take that refinement of thousand generations of trial and error, and say, this is the model of how narrative works. Well, what is narrative? Narrative is not a name that, that we, it's not a concept we create artificially and apply on things to try and make them make sense. Narrative is a name to describe processes we do naturally as individuals when we come into conflict with narratives in which we are part of a group. And we say, this is our situation. We don't like these parts of it. Here's how we'd like it to be. And therefore, we come up with an action plan to go from where it is to where we'd like it to be. And we adapt as we go. And when we've done that, we've created ourselves a narrative. 
That's all narrative is. And then the group has the same thing. And sometimes those things cross paths. Sometimes they run into each other. Sometimes individual A and individual B have narratives that in the narrative space, which is all the subject matter that we move through every day, all the people we see, all the things that we do, in the narrative space, we crunch right into each other. Sometimes we move through each other like ships in the night, like galaxies that pass through and don't affect each other. Sometimes a narrative is so strong that when it moves near you, you feel the gravitational pull because it's pulling other people and other things, which is how movements get started, where things are drawn into it. Sometimes they work like black holes. The whole science of astronomy is the same way that narrative works. It's the same laws of physics, only they're applied to psychology when you know what you're looking at. And so it's really no different, the same dynamics. So when we look at fiction today with Dramatica, where is it? Well, here's where Dramatica is, sort of the state of the union of, of Dramatica. We have the new terminology and the old terminology, you know, terms like situation or universe. I always favor the ones, the old ones like universe, because they're more accurate. But the ones like situation, they're mostly accurate and a lot more accessible. So the whole idea is, if you've got the best idea of how stories work, and everybody finds it too hard to learn, nobody comes in a practical world to do you any good whatsoever, we know the answer, but nobody else is going to. Okay, so you make it less accurate, more accessible, and pretty soon you're playing guitar in the services, you know, uh, and stuff like that. You make allowances. All right. So. Some of them work that way and we make it more accessible. But it's always good to eventually, like anybody studying Zen or Buddhism or anything else, go back and see the original terms. Even the I Ching was altered. Uh, there's the I Ching we have today, which has a certain pattern. That was altered by a king who wanted to have it favor his policies. And there's something called the pristine Yi King, which is the original way it went. And if you take the pristine Yi King and you look at all of its little hexagrams and you put them up there, they match each one of the dramatic elements. We didn't intend that. They match it because all this knowledge went into inventing the, the Yi King, the original pristine Yi King, which became the Yi Ching. And it took a lot of time to make that happen. We found the same thing here. It's just looking for the same thing and calling it a different name. They didn't have their flips and rotates, so <clears throat> screw the Yi Ching, you know, because it's just better. All right. <laughs> they rely on dice, too. You know. Okay. <clears throat> so classic terminology versus new terminology. Such things, however, are improvements. Like, I never liked the term impact character. I never liked obstacle character. It was originally obstacle character, but it sounded far too physical uh, because it's really somebody who's trying to have you bring you to a point of changing your mind. They're not, like, you know, standing in front of you conceptually, maybe, you know, philosophically. Um, so eventually we changed it to impact character for a while because I, I moaned and complained enough. And uh, then after that I said, you know, impact really isn't really what it is either because that's still it's far too physical. This is really a character that can influence you. It could be a poet dead for 200 years and you're reading his personal journal and every time you read an entry it affects you a little bit and then by the end of the story you see where his story went and you've changed because of his influence. Influence character in a story doesn't have to know they're influencing you. They don't even have to be alive. All they have to do is have an influence. It could be a rock star that you'll never meet, you'll never meet you. Uh, but because of you know listening to their music, it changes your life. They are your influence character in that particular narrative. So I thought influence is better, and I won one. It's the only one I ever won. All the rest of the ones ever since you know we locked the terms and everybody agreed that they should be. Uh, they've all been marketing decisions, and, and uh, so you know, maybe we sold a few more copies. Um, anyway, just. You all know about GISTs. If you got a Mac, you know about GISTs. If you have a Windows machine, you don't know about GISTs. GISTs are real language, natural language, kind of, uh, phraseology about subject matter that, by the way they're phrased, they contain a structural component. Like if you say, uh, um, he's, you know, what he wants more than anything else in the world is to, what he's trying to do is uh, blow up, uh, you know, uh, a government building, okay? If you say something like that, well, then his goal is to blow up the government building. So then you know that if that's his goal and it's the act of blowing something up, okay, then it's an activity. He's trying to achieve this activity. But if it says uh, his, uh, you know, his goal is to, uh, um, to, uh, you know, uh, come into possession of the stolen diamonds, okay, then all of a sudden you know that his goal is obtaining, okay. But you don't have to choose Dramatica in the new version using the words obtaining anymore. 
uh, using that, again, as I said in the poem, obtuse nomenclature. Okay, you don't have to do that. You can actually go in and make a bunch of choices and say, these are the subject matter choices I want. And because they inherently contain an element of structure, and you can make multiple choices, the more choices you make based on your story, it'll begin to gray out choices the same way as if you made them directly with the structure um, so that future choices wouldn't be there and some of the ones that you had chosen would start to be grayed out because they were no longer applicable based on other choices. And eventually, you would actually be able to zone into a structure that pretty much matches the kind of story you'd want to tell. So that's one interesting way of using it. And uh, it's not promoted much at all. But you never have to actually look at dramatic or terminology at all. You just make the choices based on these gist. Chris single-handedly came up with the concept and single-handedly wrote 12,000 gists to go into the software. Okay, And uh, you could create your own, but if you did, you might not get the structural component right because that requires an experience level to know that this terminology has that feel. Now, it doesn't read so perfectly that you can't make a wrong choice if you just choose one gist and say this is what it is. But because we all have a narrative engine inside, that's when we, why we know when a story is going wrong or when it's singing, when people are acting like people are not, is because we all think in narrative. And as a result of it, if we make a number of choices, then eventually the ones that are inconsistent will gray out and we'll end up with something that represents what we're really trying to get at. So it's a beautiful way to story form using subject matter. And if you're sure of an idea, you can spin the model with gists and it'll create a story form and fill in the, that subject matter and you can limit it to like Jim was doing one with science fiction. You can limit it to other things and when you do any subject you want, you get these wild, amazing, inventive stories because the subject matter is being mismatched kind of ad lib style, but it's a viable structure because they're gists which contain structure within the subject matter. So uh, hopefully we'll get a dramatic of five story expert for Windows soon. Um, don't hold your breath, at least a year. Uh, but, um, but if we do, but in the meantime, you know, rent a Mac and play with it if you're really stuck for a story because it's an amazing thing you can do. That's part of where it is today, is in gist. Now, movies and TV shows made with Dramatica, you know, nobody will say for sure. We hear in the back channels, and I can't verify any of this, we heard that Abrams used it on the first Star Trek movie. We heard that uh, Spock was supposed to be the main character. That's why he's so influential in it, um, as a, a powerful character. And then later they decided, well, Kirk really had to be the main character, so they made him the main character, and it, it works, but actually it was supposed to be that, that, that Spock was the main character, and it was kind of, that's what we had heard. We'd heard it was used on Picket Fences. We'd heard it was used on Band of Brothers. We've heard that it was used on, um, in the very beginning, uh, the guy who wrote The China Syndrome was one of our biggest uh, fans and just loved the thing. And uh, a guy who won a Pulitzer Prize uh, uh, for his writing uh, ended up, uh, uh, liking it very much as well. So there, it's been used a lot of places, but people don't like to talk about it because it's sort of the black op in Hollywood. They figure that, you know, if they used a tool to do it, well, then they're not so valuable. And in Hollywood's, you know, stabbing in the back uh, society, uh, you don't want to look like you're not too valuable. Um, one person describes it as that all great ideas are, are thought of in the shower of the, on the 405. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, your value goes down if you use the tool, at least they think so. So they won't come out and actually say it, but around here somewhere we have Dead Like Me, they used it, and a few other people have come up. And When we first were building it, before it was even released, um, Michael Mann came in and worked with me for about three days with his uh, writer, and we did some work on a project that he ultimately didn't pursue, uh, but he was fascinated with it, so I don't know. Might be something to this after we've um, worked with corporations in Fortune 500, We've worked with small companies that are inventing virtual reality. Uh, we worked with lots of people uh, to deal with real-world narratives, sports teams and, and uh, car companies and all kinds of things. Because it turns out that when you have this model and you apply it to the real world, you can actually find the story form structure of any problem that they want to solve. There are certain methodologies and techniques that you can develop that just turn dramatic right around to the real world and allow you to analyze anybody or anything and you look into the narrative structure and say, here's an element like a benchmark or a unique ability or something. They didn't even know to look for. They didn't even know there was meaning there. And we've been able to calculate the meaning so that with just a few data points in big data, and that's another thing that we do here is in, in big data today, uh, we're beginning to look at with just a few data points, we can make sense of a whole lot of data that, that is impossible to get meaning from by just trying to deal with statistically. 
So you get a big Twitter feed and you see that people are talking about this or that or the other thing. This can actually go in there and we're starting to be able to pick out the key points of something like that and turn what's a very complex you know, um, statistical model that they're trying to build and say it's really a very simple narrative. Here's what it means, which is the motivational map of how all the different players are involved with one another. And from that, when you know the motivational map, you can determine what behavior is going to happen next, unless something chaotic happens from outside the narrative, okay, which is always the caveat. Anyway, that's Dramatica today, and um, I have a closing poem for the Dramatica in the present. This one's a little shorter. Uh, this is called Lullaby. And this is the one where I decided to use the four through lines. You will hear them change in the course of this a couple pages long. It says, My emotions are dead and lack any resistance to the onslaught of logic's relentless persistence. I'm malleable, movable, flexible still. I succumb with a plum as I alter my will to conform to the pressures that weigh on my soul without motive or method, opinion, or goal. They reach for the stars as they stand on our hearts and they sell us off piecemeal parcels and parts. They slice us to mincemeat and padlock the door while our blood runs quite freely through holes in the floor. But nothing is wasted, though everything's lost, so our blood is recycled to offset the cost. We huddle in darkness, yet shy from the fire to howl at the moon with the rest of the choir, and when the glow wanes, we stoke it with dreams, in hopes that the crackle will drown our screams. You sleep in your bed and you doze in your chair. Your cushions are comfy and so is your air. But your heartache grows heavy as well as your head to not away, not away, not away dead. Now that went through all four through months right there. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's um, it was just an exercise, that's all. Okay. But it, uh, something vaguely artistic can be created uh, just by taking a single concept out of Dramatica and playing a little bit with it, using it as you see. Okay, Dramatica in the future. Dramatica tomorrow, where it's headed. Personal problem solving, number one thing we've always wanted to do. Back in the day, I came up with an idea for uh, a program based on Dramatica called Alter Ego, A-L-T-E-R, you know, Alter Your Ego. And um, the, uh, another one I came up with, which I'm actually building a version of myself today, but I'll, I'll give the idea to you, but look for it, you know, it's coming. Life story, become the author of your own destiny as you rewrite the story of your life. Okay, it starts to take what we've learned over the last five years about how narrative works in the real world, and apply it at a personal level so that you can look through the narratives with the other people in your life that you're involved with and even look within yourself and see the narratives inside your own heart, inside your own head, and start to see things in quads. Start to create story forms if you want to go that far, or at least learn the concept that seems as simple as a time lock or an option lock and say, I feel stressed. Is it because I'm running out of time or running out of options? And then you can act accordingly. Even we tell that to the government people, and you'd be surprised. They go, time lock, option lock, what is this? You know? mm -hmm. And then they say, oh my gosh. And they realize they had not actually been ever stopping to consider whether the pressure they were under was time-based or space-based. So every concept in Dramatica is a little Zen philosophy. It's a little fortune cookie, for God's sake. You know? And you can crack it open and use it in your life. So that would be what life story would be, personal problem solving. There's a lot of things. Uh, Steve has a pet project I won't tell you anything about, but it would have to do with... Um, with um, maximizing one's potential. And, uh, you know, he that's his pet project. And uh, I can't give you the name or anything else about it, but uh, he has a lot of faith, but uh, he needs funding. So any of you people out there who are uh, venture capitalists, give Steve a call. He's got a project for you. Um, personal problem solving, game construction. You know what's interesting is a lot of people do these interactive games and they want them to have narratives. And the problem they're running into is that if it's completely interactive, well, how do you have a narrative? Well, the fact is that Narrative can be used in game construction in a number of different ways. Again, if you go to storymind.com, not storymind.com, but storymind on YouTube, you'll find a video that includes in the title, uh, I think game theory or something like that, but just the word game. If you search, you won't find it just on YouTube if you type storymind, but if you go to the storymind YouTube channel and then search the channel, there's something in there about game theory. If you don't find it, you have to go to all the videos and scroll down about 20 or 30, and then you'll find it. It's one of the more recent ones I did. And it describes how you can use narrative so that the narrative can shift in front of you and collapse behind you because narratives are changing in the real world all the time. As we tell the government people, you might have a narrative <coughs> that is here in the narrative space. This is all the narrative space of the subject matter. It's a horrible part. I curse you. 
And um, anyway, you have all this narrative space, and the narrative is here, and then the next narrative is shifted a little bit, and the next narrative is shifted a little bit more. And if you actually can chart that, uh, not only can you then project where it might go next by the shift in narratives within the narrative space, but you can even determine what might be here that's pulling it around that way so that it gives you an idea to sense a narrative that you can't even see. You don't even have any data on it. So anyway, game construction can also have narratives that shift so that you're saying in the real world, you're able to take a narrative and blow it up so it becomes chaos. You can do that. You can totally change the, the, the rules of the game so all the pieces fall apart and the narrative is no longer functional. And if you do that, you can in advance place a string like you would in sugar water to make a girl rock candy. You can create what I call a narrative attractor. And in the real world or in gaming, you can lead a, a user uh, a game user, to be drawn in a particular direction where a narrative can be formed around something and then they will exist within that narrative until something cataclysmic happens within the story that blows up the narrative and changes all the rules and then it can reform. And because it's operating on the story engine, it doesn't have to reform in a pre-planned pattern. Pre -planned pattern. I say that five times fast. It doesn't have to do that. It doesn't have to be just a limited set it has the entire model that could reform around how that string was placed. You could even give the user uh, choices about that they could make about what was the nature of the string, which would determine how the narrative would reform around it organically. And so these are things that can be programmed right now, uh, but uh, we haven't had anybody hire us to do it yet. We've talked to a few people, uh, but it's amazing. The, the, you know, the easy stuff is just creating narratives and then have another narrative that follows that they go through a door and here's a new narrative or, you know, you, you change the subject matter around or you shift who's the main character and all that. You know, but this stuff of, of rebuilding and destroying narratives is the way you really need to go because the game is going to be interesting because of this narrative space. It's this world that was created that has these kinds of creatures and these things happen and these rules exist for that matrix, as it were. And then the narratives that you create within it move you through that world to see all the interesting parts of it in combinations that no other user would ever see because the narratives that are created are unique to your play based on your choices. Okay, so there's a lot to go there. Social networks. Right now, social networks, what have you got? You've got people put together by subject matter. You know, you say, this person's playing this game, uh, your friends are interested in this. Uh, you just did a search for that on Amazon, so here's 1,300 ads for it all over your Facebook page, okay? It doesn't like that. It brings people together based on subject matter interests. You've got, you know, people who, uh, who form groups and communities and things based on weird, you know, things that they like, like Dramatica, you know? Or, or they come together based on something like um, they like the Civil War, or they're interested in science fiction, or a particular problem like a program like Supernatural or something. They become fans, okay, or a political party. But the thing is, that doesn't say how they think, it just says what they're thinking about. And what Dramatica can do for social networks is with some very simple tracking of the order in which people do things, you can use the sequential nature of the signposts and journeys to be able to determine what the motivational map is by reverse engineering, which we often do in the government work is to say, we can see that this happened and this happened and this happened. Okay, that's brought us down to 10 story forms, okay? Uh, just by knowing the order in which things actually happen, and we can then figure out what's ticking on the inside that they have no data on. So the same thing can happen with people in social networks. So you could start bringing them together so you not only have people who like the Civil War, but they're also like-minded. Not that they're like-minded about the Civil War, but they think alike, and they also like the Civil War. And there you can have complementary people. You know, remember, you've got the companion pairs and the dependent pairs. You can bring all that together. You can make narratives once you have Dramatica. So it's not just subject matter and it's not just chaos in the Wild West out there, but people are coming together in a narrative fashion um, to form complete group minds. And that's something social networks don't have right now. Social engineering. You can go out and see a group mind that's functioning right now, whether it's a movement or a club or a philosophy or, or a project, and you can go in there and just one little thing. I used to think as a kid, wouldn't it be great if, I'll bet you, every building has one spot where if you hit it with just the right force, in just the right place, you know, the whole building comes down. I, I, I said, it's got to be. It's got to be, you know. I'm still not sure it isn't. But the thing is, I wish it was, you know. 
even if it never happened, it'd just be cool if it was that way. Um, but the thing is, narratives are like that. Uh, in the government, they call them inflection points, uh, not tipping points. Tipping points are areas where it could go either way. Inflection points are where you can go in and actually tweak a narrative by changing one thing. And believe it or not, narratives, like galaxies, have all this, these aren't just points, they have gravity among them. They want to stay together. A narrative tries to stay together. It has cohesion, it has gravity. So if you go in and you tweak a little something and it puts a ripple in there, then all these other things around it are going to adjust until they've worked that ripple out. They've, they've muted it. And at that point, you've changed the narrative. It's the same thing that happens to us when we're affected by something and start using feeling instead of logic. We've adapted to pressure. You can go and you can tweak a narrative and change something and the narrative will adapt and then reform, okay? And that will be its new memory form, is that once it's reformed, it'll try to stick with that if any changes are made and bring it back as close as it can. So it turns out you can predict by how much influence a given story point has that here's a place where if you tweak it, it's going to take a lot of power to tweak that one because it's connected to all this stuff directly. And other story points, they don't have that kind of influence. I'm going to think, 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 think. You've changed four little things, and then the cumulative effect of all of that will cause the narrative to go through a slight undulation. Anybody ever see Forbidden Planet? You know, the, the original movie? Uh, science fiction. Uh, yeah, a scientist yeah. goes place, finds a civilization, they have mm -hmm. the ability to do things with their minds, controlled by a big machine that gives them power to make things actualize. And after he lands there, the whole planet goes through a slight adjustment. And what it was doing is it was just you to do that for the human mind instead of the alien mind that was originally there. Narratives are like that. If you just change a few things. So you can actually predict cost, risk. You can go through and predict what needs to be done in order to get the best effect. And which things are risky because if you do them, there might be a backlash effect or you might actually bring down the whole narrative uh, because it's going to break the structure. It can't adapt if you do too much. So that's part of what you can do with social engineering or even at government level uh, with, um, you know, black ops. Um, natural language, to be able to totally use complete natural language like we're speaking right now, which is sort of what I'm doing, and use that uh, to create a story form in dramatic just by typing a natural language. I want to do a story about a guy who says this and such and such and such and that's in the future. It'll actually be able to do that if we're able to put the time in to create it. And uh, I don't know if I have the interest in doing it. And, uh, we need more people who learn it as well as I do so they can keep doing this when I can't anymore. Um, natural uh, language, auto-ingest. Auto-ingest is where um, you could send, take dramatic and have it operating, say, for a corporation that wants to know if there are any competitors out there who are going to be moving into their same area. And they, so they send it out into a big data pipeline. And all this stuff comes through. And it's sifting through at these you know, rapid rates and it's finding narrative components that pertain to certain subject matter. And when it has enough, it begins to assemble them together until it can maybe find narratives out of all of this apparently chaotic data. And it can say, there's a narrative pertaining to this particular kind of people, pertaining to this kind of activity, and it red flags it and gives it to you an operator. So it's actually out there looking by itself, auto-ingest and auto-creation of, um, of narratives. This is something we've actually talked about getting funding for, so it's not that far out there uh, to be able to say, uh, this guy's purpose is to uh, uh, attack this country. Uh, this guy, you know, uh, some other news story says, um, you know, he'd really like it if he was able to um, do some damage to this country. It takes the natural language. It sees both of those are talking about the same goal. It gets enough of those. It corroborates them and it says, there, here's a the goal. Then it finds other things pertaining to that person that pertain to other story points by other things that's out there in the big data pipeline. It starts to assemble the pieces and suddenly you've got yourself, you know, a narrative that has auto-ingested and auto-formed. Um, the dynamic model and brain freeze. All right. This is going to be very quick. Um, over here, I have a uh, uh, just a little thing on here for the dynamic model. I just want to show you this. There's, I don't remember most of the stuff I wrote here because it was a very intense time. It was like almost a fugue state. This is a book called Narrative Dynamics. You can get it on Amazon. If you have Amazon Kindle, you can read it for free if you have Kindle on the internet. Um, Otherwise, you have to pay on two ninety eight or something. Two ninety eight. Okay. So, if you want to know about narrative dynamics, this is the structure. That's half of it. The other half is dynamics. Dynamics are all the forces that make this thing turn. It's the forces in the rubber bands I talked about earlier. Dynamics are the emotions. Dynamics is the passion. 
Structure just tells you what it is. It doesn't tell you how much. Dynamics tell you how much. Structure tells you where it's going. It doesn't tell you how fast. Dynamics tell you how fast. Dynamics and structure work hand in hand. They're two different worlds. Basically, here's a way to understand dynamics. And I really got wrapped up in dynamics for a while. I was like zoning. Every time I go, I see sailboats are turning this way and that way, and the masts are going up like this. And that represents a quad here. It's like, you know, um, I was having these conversations over dinner with government clients. It was very bad. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> here's dynamics. Imagine that the mind, your attitude, your, your psychology, is a big piece of wax that has a particular shape based on your human life experiences. And when you're under a lot of pressure, just like a gas, that pressure will create heat, and that heat will soften your resolve all over in your entire personality. You begin to be willing to change just about anything to get out of the psychological pressure you're under. And you've all been under pressure that strong. We're willing to change just about anything to get out from under. And when you do at that point, then depending on what the situation is, something may change part of the way you are. Now, it's like memory foam. If the pressure gradually releases, then it gradually goes back to the way it was, and you really haven't changed. You just temporarily adapted, but you go back to the way you were. But if the pressure comes in at the right speed to create all that heat and melt the configuration of your psyche, and then it's dissipated in a big moment of epiphany or something, at that point, then it's like taking one of those gas things and letting out the gas and, and it gets cold. So basically, whatever configuration you're in, if that happens, it'll freeze and that'll be the new you. Okay. So that if the pressure comes on to create a malleable situation inside your heart and mind, and that's how you end up with Stockholm Syndrome. That's how you end up with, with people falling in love with their kidnappers. Okay. That's how you end up with people who, who shift allegiances. Um, that's what happens is they get under tremendous pressure and flip a double agent that way. It's going on with some of the government stuff. Okay, It's basically that they get a lot of pressure. It heats up because it comes at the right rate, at the right intensity. It makes them malleable. And then before it dissipates and allows them to return to who they normally would be, you take it off all at once. Here's $500,000. That'll solve all your, your problems. And boom. They've frozen into a new form, and that becomes the new memory form. So that from that point forward, even if pressures come on, they go off again, they'll return to that new form, not the old one, because it's been irre irrevocably altered. And that's how we're changed by things. The only thing you can do to avoid it is to stay away from any influences if you get into that state, because you can be altered, okay, even unintentionally by anything, or to find a way to make sure you never allow yourself to be under that kind of pressure that you actually are willing, even at a subconscious level, to change anything about yourself. That's what narrative dynamics are all about. They'll tell you, you know, like they say, well, how intensely is this person, you know, hoping? Well, dramatic, I can't tell you that, but the dynamic model could. They'd say, hope is, you know, 80% of the maximum hope anyone could feel this person's feeling right now. And it's now in this scene that's dropped to 70, in this scene it's 60, in this scene it's 90, you know. And you'd be able to actually follow curves and, and sine waves and all kinds of forms that would, would make that happen. So the dynamic model is where I did an awful lot of work. I wrote all kinds of stuff on it. And I got reached the point where I said to solve that completely would take another 25 years. I'm, I'm going to retire. Okay, so that's for somebody else to solve. Now, I'll give you the short one here, the poem about Dramatica in the future to close that thought. And then we'll go to Beyond Dramatica. And that's, that's sort of our closing. This one about the future of dramatic and all the esoteric things it can do. Called the Cosmic Flea. It says, can you be a cosmic flea twixt handle crank and cog, a particle that rides the waves upon the cosmic dog? Or are you doomed to be marooned along that furry shore and strain against the handle till crank turns cog no more? Well, I'm leaving the furry shore. I've made myself a little raft and I'm gonna leave others to figure out the dynamic model. All I did was point the way with the book, Narrative Dynamics. And so anybody wants to read it, you can get a jump start on how a whole other side of dramatic could be created that would be the side that would express all the passion and the force and the acceleration and the you know the change in delta acceleration, you know, delta A, okay, all that stuff you will get in the in the you know. Now we move to Beyond Dramatica. Beyond Dramatica. Um, you know, in, in Christmas Carol, they have the ghost of Christmas past, present, future, you know, 
And there's one more. You've probably heard in the classes that we've had. Uh, there's one more. Nobody ever thinks about them as, as uh, goes. But if you look up the dramatic, it says past, present, future, and how things are changing, which is original. It was progress. Who's the ghost we haven't mentioned? We, we have past, present, future, progress. Who's the ghost of progress? Marley himself. He's the fourth ghost. Because Marley says, when I died, your chain was already this long, Scrooge, and you're building it longer link by link every day. Why, by now, it's this long. And if you keep living and doing these things, it's going to get even longer, and you're really screwed. That's the progress you're having in your life. And Dickens, because all of us think in narrative, he was so tuned into narrative, he could publish things like that uh, sequentially. You know, a chapter every week in a newspaper for 19 or 26 weeks or something like that, and it would be a perfect narrative. The guy was just, he thought in narrative. Intuitively, he knew he needed four ghosts, and if he only did, if he'd left any one of them out, it wouldn't have been a complete argument. That's why it works, okay? So the thing is that when we're looking at, at the past, present, future of Dramatica, now we're looking at progress when we're looking at beyond Dramatica. It's the fourth part of the quad. We're looking at what progress has been made during all of that. If all of that is the spaghetti, what's the sauce that has happened along the way? Uh, this is kind of, what does Dramatica really mean? What are its implications? What does it really have to say about science or art or the heart or, or anything of that nature? What does it have to say about philosophy or religion or life or death? You know, what's the true meaning and implication of the, the, the theory? Well, we talked about how the story of mind reflects real life. We can't help but think of narratives because the smallest narrative is a quad, and we always think in quads because we're always thinking in four dimensions. When we think in three elements from this quad and one from that, that's when we're doing justification. It doesn't belong together. They don't belong together because they're not part of the same family. And if we look at something with three ways from this family and one way from that family, then we're going to have a warped view. And that warped view is what leads to all of our justifications, all of our rationalizations, all the things we talked about earlier. And so quads are how we think. If we train ourselves to think in quads so that we are looking at something and saying, oh, okay, what do I do about this? Well, there's this part, this part, this part, this part. Jim has seen me do this in the last few months, a couple months since I've been down, months, months since I've been down here, is that everything's a quad with me. That's why tonight was dramatic and past, person, future, and progress. Everything's a quad. It's the best way to organize. doesn't mean you're completely wrong if you do it the other way, but it does mean that you're not as right as you could be, okay? And so if you think in quads, you will always be seeing life as best as you can see it, okay? Uh, we can't go beyond that, really. All stories, as I mentioned, are about the dissonance between the personal narrative, and we all have hundreds of them, one for our, our job, uh, ten for our job, one for each coworker we've got. We've got narratives, you know, coming out our ears. We've got narratives coming out places we don't want to know about, okay? We've got narratives all over. It's just the code of matrix. It's the way we think. And if you stare into that, if you stare into anything, you eventually see yourself. Because you're looking at the only patterns you can see. Why are the laws of physics the laws of physics? Because there aren't any others? Because these are the ones that exist objectively? No, it's because the only ones we'll ever be able to perceive because we can only perceive things in quads. Any kind of law of physics that in the real universe works outside of a quad system is not something that we'll ever be able to see. We won't know it's there and it won't even be obvious by being missed because any effect it has is not going to be seen by us either. Okay, so that's, you know, the universe is not what we think it is, it's what we perceive it to be, okay? Um, the quad is the secret to happiness. Overstated. It won't really bring you happiness, but it is the secret to having a lack of inequity. In other words, any inequity that you have in your life, Anything that's hurting you, anything that's a problem, it can't make the pain go away. It can't make the happiness bigger. But it can help you understand that this is the only option. This is the way it must be. These are the things that you can do. These are the things that you can't do. <laughs> no when to play. No when to fold. No when to walk away. Anyway, yeah, it's, it can do that. It can do that. And if you train yourself, I, I think the quad should be what's trained to every kindergarten and from there on out. I think that every preschooler should be learning to look at things in quads. If we did, what using quads does is it prevents you from justifying without realizing you're doing it. That's the one thing it does. You might still be a total mass murderer and love killing people, but you can't pretend that you had to do it anymore because the quad won't let you. If you start thinking in quads, 
you may still exactly do what you did, but you can never pretend that it, it was justified anymore. And so that alone will stop some people from doing some of the things they do in the world. It will help other people to understand that most people are really good. They just see things differently in their narrative than we see them in ours. And they're giving us the best response they can from their life experience compared to the life experience we have and what we're trying to do. And we come into conflict when you have a main character and influence character, not because it's apples and oranges, but because once the person says, we're the same because I'm apples and you're oranges. And, and we're both fruit. And the other guy says, no, we're not the same at all because I'm citrus and, and you know, you're and even better if you say, we're the same because we're fruit. And the guy says, no, we're not the same. I'm an apple and you're a tomato. Well, a tomato is technically a fruit, okay? No, it's a vegetable, okay? No, it's a fruit. It really is a fruit, you know, scientifically it's a fruit. But people don't think of it that way. And so you end up with this kind of 90 degree thing between an influence character and the main character. If you are able to accept that somebody else might be seeing it using a different standard of evaluation, then you can give them some slack to say, that's valid for the way you're looking at it, but mine is equally valid for the way I'm looking at it. In conflict, world peace, maybe not, but a lessening of world tension and a little more tolerance maybe so. Okay. So that's something you do. Now, it's not a philosophy. It's not a religion. It's not really a science because it's based on finding a pattern that exists in the narrative. It's not done by scientific experimentation empirically. Okay. So I don't know what this is. You know, Chris had a vision many years ago when we first started this because he knew that I wanted to get into the personal problem solving and world peace area and teach people how to use this thing but he was afraid it would turn into a religion. So the first edition of the dramatic theory book says, this ain't no Bible, it's just a damn book right at the beginning, okay? To make sure people didn't get the wrong idea. We took it out later because nobody did get the wrong idea, so why the hell? Anyway, but he was he had a dream one time. They told me about it, came in and he said, I saw that there were crowds and crowds of people and I had been in a coma and I'd fallen asleep for like 15 years. And when I woke up, there's all these crowds of people outside the balcony. And you're standing there in a white robe, and they're all bowing down to you. <laughs> okay. So I haven't seen any of that happen tonight, so that's a good sign. But the thing is, I, I think that beyond dramatic, we have to move into psychology. I told a psychologist once, he said, so you're saying that if somebody sat in front of a television uh, set, and they were, they were catatonic, okay, and non-responsive, that, that they could be... Uh, brought out of it just by watching television. I said, narratives resonate with the mind. The reason they're catatonic is not because their senses have really been shut off. It's because the mind is refusing to see what, the, to experience what the senses are actually telling it. It has a barrier put up. But that, that sensory stuff can create a narrative that is in contradictory resonance to those barriers that eventually would be able to pass through that filter and alter the state of the catatonia. And he threw me out of his office and canceled the talk I was supposed to give about the psychology, psychological aspects of narrative. Because he was a psychiatrist. A psychologist who worked for him was vastly more interested. Uh, but psychiatrists, boy, they hate this stuff. You know, a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, we went out to, to a university once to teach this. And uh, the fellow who put it together, uh, it's an annual event where people come together from all the universities to have film schools. And they... Uh, they, they come together. We went out to this, to this universe this time. And uh, I explained, and this is how it works. It's all these nuts and bolts. In those days, it's much more mechanical. So I can't fault the guy who said, well, I think I can speak for all of the people that, that, that are here in the department, that the reason we got into this was because of its mystery and beauty, and that taking this mechanical approach to it uh, is just repugnant to us, and we don't want any part of it. You know? And I basically said, well, I feel like Galileo here. Uh, I said, you know, are you telling me that if an instructor finds that there's something that explains what's going on, they shouldn't teach it to their students because it ruins the mystery? And he got so pissed. Uh, he told Steve Lavery he never wanted to speak to that woman again, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, was, I was obnoxious even more then than I am today. And I'm just crusty, okay? So as we wind up here, insights into physics, you know, uh, I talked about, you know, the gases, I talked about the strong and weak forces. Why is there a galaxy in, 
uh, a spiral in a galaxy and a spiral in a teacup and a spiral in a seashell. Are there really spirals there? Do they know there's spirals? Okay. Do they have any awareness of that? Does a painting know what colors are on it? that it actually makes it into a picture of a tree or a person? Of course it doesn't. It's all in our perception. So when we see these things, they are, again, the patterns that we're able to perceive. And we take the data and we find the nearest pattern. And if it's something that falls close enough, we'll say, that's part of this pattern. It's a, it's a spiral galaxy, OK? Just like I'm stirring my tea, OK? I understand a spiral. Is that what's going on out there? Hell no. It's something completely different. It's got different forces. There's all kinds of things going on. But we can get a grip on it at a certain level just by saying, oh, I sort of understand what's going on there. Okay, this is the way the mind works. And so when we look into physics or we look into psychology, we will see it most clearly if we do it in quads. We will see it most clearly if we do it in narrative. We will see it most clearly if we use the story form as an analytic tool for physics and psychology <coughs> or the basis of a philosophy to build it on all four towers of, of what the structure is. It will always be the best that can be built, the clearest that we can see. And so on that, I have one more poem and then one last little thing and we're out. The poem is about the fact that we impose our patterns on everything, it's called inverse. And it says, if you could look into infinity, all you'd see is the back of your head. And if you were living forever, you'd clearly be nothing but dead. But if you jumped out of the system where time is the flip side of space, you could be everywhere, though you'd never been there, and you'd stare right back into your face. So that's the, uh, the nature of that. Now, the very last thing is, besides Dramatica, okay, and uh, I will... Can you read that one more time, please? <laughs> you know, people have asked it before. The government people wanted me to write it out. A guy named... I will tell you his name. It's probably covert. Anyway, but um, he asked me, he said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, over oh, in a long time out in Virginia. And... Uh, he said, you write that for me, so I wrote that for him. He was so very happy. He said, I'm going to have that frame. Here, here you go. If you could look into infinity, all you'd see is the back of your head. And if you were living forever, you'd clearly be nothing but dead. But if you jump out of the system where time is the flip side of space, you could be everywhere, though you'd never been there, and you'd stare right back into your face. Okay. And then, there, anybody want it, you can have it. Okay. <laughs> I think Chris yeah. Nolan is uh, <laughs> somewhere in the room where he wrote that. Now, uh, over here... Did you get my, uh, my comment just now with Chris Nolan? No, I didn't. Oh, have you seen uh, Interstellar? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, it, Interstellar would be a perfect example of that same kind of thing, yeah. coming back to look at yourself, yes, um, from a different place, different time. All right, so beyond Dramatica, okay, uh, besides Dramatica, uh, life other than Dramatica, I'm going to do one thing. Um, I compose a lot of music. And it ranges from stuff that sounds like it was done by the Mothers of Invention and Frank Zappa back in the 60s, all the way to something that sounds classical, like something for the death of uh, Princess uh, Diana. And uh, it's, you know, some of it's fully orchestrated, some of it's just tunes. I've got a page on my website that's got like 300 different little tunes and ditties and fully developed songs. I've been doing it since the 70s. I really like that. But I've just got one here. I was trying to decide between two, and I'm, and I'm going to play it while I show you something else. Uh, I think I'll play uh, this one. It's called Murky. Now, while that's playing, I'm going to uh, show you this. I also am into photography in the style of Ansel Adams. And um, I just grabbed some things randomly. These aren't my best shots. These are just a few that I happen to have that I found quickly. But the fact is, um, I take a variety of shots as well. Portraits, abstracts, black and white color, uh, still life, people, you know. I have some really good stuff. I have a book out of photography. But music for me, piano, um, synthesizer. Um, I played brass instruments. I used to play the accordion as a kid. Um, and um, uh, guitar. Um, do a lot of vocals and things, too. Um, but um, anyway, as you can see, there's a lot more. And all this had to be put on hold for Dramatica for 25 years. And all of this is whenever I could find a moment. Uh, I told the guys once, I said, the thought of Dramatica is so big and it hurts so much, I had to put my entire personality on the hard drive so that all the RAM is all dramatic all the time. And I lost myself in it to try and think of this damn thing, okay? But having done it, I got myself back off the hard drive. It's kind of like Johnny Mnemonic with uh, you know, Reeves. I got most of myself back. Um, I found peace. But 
I want out. <laughs> and before I go, I want to share what I know. So as I said, there's a series of, of classes that are all free on Monday nights that are pertaining to theory aspects for you theory hogs. And then there's also a whole series of full day. Now the full day courses, they're $149.95. You can also take them on the internet for $79.95, or you can get a recorded version after the fact for $49.95 that you get access to or even stream it after the class. The one that's the internet, you can ask questions uh, during the class and we'll be able to answer them. That's why it's a little more like a recorded version. But there's a whole list of them at storymind.com slash classes. And uh, the free ones, you know, are free also on the internet. That'll give everybody the theory, and then hopefully the paid ones will give people tools in exchange. They'll give me my photography and my music back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for letting me move forth. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And if you just want to, you know, do a general chit chat, that's fine too. If you all just want to run through the door, that's cool. Also. <laughs> Thank you, um, when we walk out of here tonight, what's the singular piece of advice you could give us to start thinking and pause? Is there any one thing we can do to? Ah, huh, one thing. Or a good parent. Yeah. I yeah, would that's say. I would say that remember the two primary cause, the one that describes the outside world and the one that describes the inside world, mass and energy and space and time. And I'll put them in quad form for you so that you can see them side by side and see how they hang up. And if you could look at these items. Like each other. Thank you. I think this thing. Okay. Mass and energy and space. And time. Knowledge, um, ability, and design. When you're dealing with issues in your external life that are more logistic, use this one to figure out the logistics and make sure that whatever you're looking at, there's one of these things that's in there. These two are going to be at a simpler level, these two are going to be more complex. This is where awareness comes from, this is where self awareness comes from. Thought and knowledge ability and desire, you can see that they have the same relationships. Desire is the time of the mind. Why? Because you look to the past, compare it to the future, or compare it to the present, and project to the future, and determine how you feel about things. That's where desire comes from. Without time, there would be no desire, because things are what they are. It is time that makes desire desire. The mind is a machine made of time. Every gear and pulley is a process, not an object. So the thing is, I would say, keep these two parts handy and compare them and find out what makes them the same. If you find out what makes them the same, which are the relationships among the items, as you know, each one of those has dynamic pairs in two directions. Each one has companion pairs, higher and lower. Each one has dependent pairs on one side and on the other side. And if you look those items up, companion, dependent, um, and uh, dynamic, you'll find out the meanings of those. Some are conflicting, some are um, peripherally affecting the other one, and some, like dependencies, are dependent upon one another. These are the same in both quads. Once you see what's the same in both quads, then you're able to look at anything and say, does this make a quad? So when we pick the easy ones with the gases or something else. Let's just pick an object, a, a topic that you want to talk about and uh, pick something, and let's see if we can find a quad out of it. Okay, pick one item. Anything. Love. 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 Okay, so if you have love, any single item can make a number of quads because we don't know if we're going up or down or sideways with it. But if we put in love, let's assume that's in the K position for a moment. We're going to say love is the object. Okay, now what would be the opposite of love? The exact opposite of love. Nate would be down here. Okay, it would have to be. Now here comes the tricky part because there's several quads you can make from this love-hate quad as yeah. to what would go here. Okay, and this thing would have another pair. Now looking over here, if this is mass is love and hate is thought and hate is energy. Okay, and uh, in a sense that's true. If you look at love, it's more like love is this is love. Hate is <coughs> more like the process, the energy, the force that puts behind it. Love and hate. What would be space? Okay, one you could do, you know, like and dislike, but that doesn't really do it. This just matters of degree. How about compassion? 
Compassion could go in there. Okay, if you put compassion, then what would be the opposite of compassion? What is the opposite of compassion? Disdain? No, not really disdain. You see, the thing is, we may not have a word for it in the English language when you think about it, because the opposite of compassion, compassion, ambivalence would be a neutral. Is it ambivalence is you don't care about? It. Right, you don't care about it's it. It's the opposite of caring. You're, yeah, it's the opposite of caring. It's it's the lack of caring, not the opposite of caring. And that's yeah. an important thing that you have to look at is you have to look for the opposite of caring. Which so is isn't apathy the actual opposite of love? Uh, it could be in another quad. Mm -hmm. And first, let's finish this one. This is the opposite. It would be it would be almost like the meaning, uh, like. Uh, uh, I don't know what the word would be, but taking pleasure in others' misfortune. Oh, well, the Germans have a shot <laughs> Is that the word? It's in German. Yeah, yeah. really. Okay. The German word. Okay. So <laughs> the German word. The German word. English word is. Okay. Yeah. Now, th there may not be one in English. And that's the thing is, every culture has its own blind spot. That's not a blind spot in the German culture. It's a blind spot in American culture, in American English, probably British English uh, as well. And so. Uh, but that would be it. It would be that word that would mean uh, meaning ill towards others, as opposed to, um, you know, or enjoying it when others are, are are having problems, as opposed to hurting when others have problems and you know and caring for them. This would be taking pleasure in them having problems, uh, love and hate. That would be fun. Now the other one that you came up with was uh, apathy. Okay. So if you want to say love is here. Apathy wouldn't be an exact opposite of love. Apathy, which is not caring, would be caring, would be the opposite of apathy. doesn't mean whether you're caring by hating or caring by, by, uh, by uh, loving. It just means that apathy is not caring at all. Remember Tommy Lee Jones in The Fugitive? I don't care. Okay? That's what he's saying. He basically has apathy. He doesn't care one way or another. Okay? He's feeling nothing. So if you're feeling something, then you're caring. So if you have still love, hate here, which would still put these as opposites, making a valid quad, then over here you could choose to put apathy, and here you would put caring. Okay, and that would make a valid quad. So if these are the things you want to look at, then you now have the best way of organizing them by finding the opposites and putting them in this form. And then you can see, uh, in this case, how these would fit. Now, does this look like the proper quad? It doesn't. Why doesn't it? Because caring and apathy, you know, seem like it's not a companion piece to love. Apathy is not a companion piece to love, whereas compassion is a companion piece to love. And hate is not companion to caring, even if it's negative caring, it's not companion because it's no more companion caring than love is. And love isn't dependent on caring, if it's negative caring, and hate isn't dependent on apathy. But over here, compassion is dependent on hate, and hate on compassion. And the D word about, you know, uh, being happy with other people like is dependent on love. They are in a dependency, negative dependency, but a dependency. So the thing is that until it all works in a, in a system where all the relationships actually function the way they should, then you don't have a valid quad. Now you can get a semi-valid quad. I think this one's probably not valid at all. This one is semi-valid. If you, you swap caring with that, the one you should erase it, you'd put caring in the top right, but that would have been No, it still wouldn't, still wouldn't have been closer because caring could be caring negatively or caring positively. It could be caring <laughs> with okay, or caring with love. It, it, it could do that. But um, it, uh, it doesn't form the right relationship. So the, the hard thing is... Sorry, no, I have to head out. Oh, okay. okay. Gentlemen, good nice evening. Nice seeing you. Thank you so much. Right. I appreciate it. Okay. I'll be in contact. Okay, very good. Yeah, we've been working on a short story. It's a short movie script. Um, anyway, but um, yeah, the thing is to try and come up with a quad and find all the four pieces of the problem that you're dealing with, whatever problem you're dealing with, See it in fours, not in threes. The reason is that in threes, which is how we tend to look at things, is we stand on one to evaluate the others. And that's the last thing I'll give you tonight, is that 
if you're standing here, there are two ways of looking at the situation. How it affects you from there, how that affects you, and how that affects you, we call that a splay. Okay, as it splays out. And then you have another quad over here, and this is called a display, which is I'm standing here and I'm looking at how these things relate to each other. We think this is objectivity because we're standing outside it looking at how they relate to one another. And we think this is subjective because we're seeing how all the things relate to us. But in fact, we don't really have true subjectivity we, because that would just be only us by ourselves. It wouldn't be in relationship to anything else. And we don't have true objectivity because objectivity would be to see that we're part of that family, part of that quad, and that to be able to stand outside it and see ourselves in it. So these are the kinds of things we need to know about the quad. The more we learn about it, the better we're able to make decisions. Uh, I've used it in organizing reports. I've used it in setting up web pages. I've used it in, in having discussions with people. I've used it in solving problems or relationships with family members. And uh, uh, you're never going to get perfect at it, but it is the best tool I've found to understand the micro narratives of our lives. To define what they mean? Yeah, for the client. It's like if this was a map. Yeah. So that's what we would do. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, what you're looking at in those is uh, the relationships that go into those are basically the, uh, the trigonometric functions of uh, sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, and cosecant. Uh, uh, and uh, those, those are the functions. But the problem is there's one extra function uh, that is where the imaginary number is in trigonometry. And that is the function at which the math sort of fails in trig. Um, and that is if you see all three, four items, not in the relationships, but you see them, the fourth kind of relationship is where you see them as component or collective. Component is when they're all individuals, like in a family, everybody's in their own room doing their own thing, they don't really have a family relationship, that is a component. But if there's somebody who attacks from the outside, they band together as a family and suddenly they are a cohesive unit. And that then makes them a collective as opposed to a component. So when they are um, uh, independent component and then they're collective, that actually trumps everything. So that if you have in this a subjective view, here's a little brother who's, and the big brother says, little brother is down here and he's a puppy. He's dependent on me. Okay. And then over here, you have little brother saying, no, we're pals. We go everywhere together, okay? This is a negative. This is seen as a positive. You multiply the negative times the positive, the little brother up there, and you get a negative um, uh, relationship here, which is basically a negative um, dynamic relationship is, is devised out of these because there's a negative dependent positive um, companion, which then create a negative. But if you bring in that other thing which makes them come together as a group to fight off the enemy from the outside, that trumps them and then turns the negative into a positive relationship because they're family. And it brings it up. Now that's where the imaginary number comes through. There's actually, uh, we realized if we were to describe this in math, trigonometry wouldn't do it and we didn't have quadronometry. Because it has to not have something that's played out cyclically over time, like we talked about before, it has to have something that can see both the cycle aspect and also this plot over time simultaneously to generate this extra dimensional image that goes beyond that, that combines both the cycle of nature and the play out. So when you look at the sine wave moving around here, and you look at the sine wave on the side, what you need to do is have a fourth function that would be the equivalent of this that would produce that extra dimensional view that would show it to be the helix that it is in, in, in that extra dimensional space. And so that function, I have no idea how to create a function for that that would create a quadrinometry. But that's sort of what you would need, a step beyond what you do with trigonometry in order to describe the model, because the model itself contains time already built in. It's not something you can't plot it against time. Because time's already part of it. It's yeah. It's basically um, yeah. And Heisenberg uh, be damned. But uh, the fact is that in it you have um, you have 
uh, particle and wave coexisting simultaneously in the same time space. So if you look at the model and you see it in this three-dimensional form, that's kind of the um, space-time of the mind, space-time continuum of the mind, as it were. It contains time. Uh, one last thing. Uh, okay, here you go. We talked about A equals MC squared. Here's, here's where it crops up again. A equals MC squared. Okay, so um, if we um, if you have T over K equals AD, which is one of the equations. This is an equation sort of looking from the inside out as opposed to the outside in. If you have that and you uh, solve for T, then you end up with multiplying each side by K, and you end up with T on this side equals K AD. Okay. Now, what you're really looking at here is if you have this form, why isn't there two things over here? Why do we have C squared? Well, C squared is a speed of light constant squared in centimeters per second. So it's energy in herbs equals mass of gas times speed of okay. Energy in herbs was something that was invented to just say that's what this result is. Okay, it wasn't something pre existing. Right? Energy in herbs equals mass of gas times speed of light constant squared in centimeters per second. What the speed of light is, what is speed? Speed is time and space. Okay, so you can look at it as frequency and you can look at it as wavelength. Wavelength is the speed. Is the spatial version of that, and frequency is the time version of speed. And when you look at it, the reason it seems to be a constant, speed of light constant, is when frequency goes up, okay, uh, wavelength, uh, you know, and frequency are have an inverse relationship in space time. That means that it appears to be a constant when one is shifting the other compensates for it. Uh, it's like desirability. If there's zero desire, there's no desirability. If there's zero ability, there's no desirability. But for any value other than zero, you're going to get a positive value of desirability based on the two put together. What this really means is that if you're looking from inside the universe, you see it as C squared. But if you look at it from outside the mind, you see it as TKAD. You don't see it as TK desirability squared, you know which it would be if you were looking at the, the mind from the inside. That's why when we're trying to figure out what we want and don't want, we see our desirability as the thing that drives us. You know, Guys often say, uh, I use logic, I'm not influenced by emotion. Well, yeah, you're influenced by emotion. You're influenced by emotion because you're deciding where you're going to apply your logic. When you use your logic, it's all logic, but why did you use it for this instead of that? Desirability. Okay, that's the answer, desirability, right there. And so we tend from inside, that's the ultimate justification, because that's our operating system. That's why there's different equations for male and female, and for the eight archetypes, each has a different equation, is that we're actually blending things, and we can't take them apart. And because we can't take them apart, for women, it's not desirability. It's thought knowledge. And if you've got that for a while, mm -hmm. thought knowledge is what women tend to build, okay, uh, to blend together. And so, anyway, so that's the relationship between the, the, the two, and... Um, that is how you end up with the equations relating to what's going on in the physical world and why you need the extra thing in trigonometry to deal with and why you can never see it from the inside because it's always going to appear to be this combined thing squared instead of one thing times another. Okay. Um, anyway, um, I'm not very strong in math, so I've avoided all of this stuff as much as I could. I, I'm a modeler. I see patterns and I make models in my head. So that's, that's what I do. And then the models are analogous to, to uh, the way the system operates. And then the model, if it's truly 100% analogous, can be predictive. And then you can learn things from watching the model that you haven't observed in reality. And if it's predictive, then it will match and then you have some validation. So it can never be proven, but it can only be unproven. But so far, it's always proven itself. <laughs> so far. All right. Awesome. Okay, it's okay. <laughs>